David, what were the most interesting parts of the Hall of Fame voting to you? We're going to talk to Adnan Verk about this as well a little bit later in the show. But can you sort of walk us through after listening to everybody talk about this for a couple of days? What did you find most interesting? That there is such unbelievable amounts of love toward Barry Bonds and him being in the Hall of Fame and how you can't have a Hall of Fame without the greatest hitter in the history of baseball, without the home run leader, as though everybody in the Hall of Fame now shouldn't be there because Barry Bonds is not there. And I think people completely have misunderstood what it means when you get inducted into the Hall of Fame. It is not about who makes up the history of baseball. It is about who gets a plaque in the plaque room. And that's the biggest misunderstanding. You have your own Barry Bond stories. You've told us about some of the negotiations. You've told him that as the hitting coach, he was a disaster. What can you tell us about your experiences with Barry Bonds that perhaps people don't know or haven't heard from you? Well, I had experiences with him as a player. So he was he had a very tight relationship with Jeffrey. And there was a time when Jeffrey wanted to go on the team plane with the San Francisco Giants or Barry Bonds wanted to come on the team plane with the Marlins because he was flying somewhere or Jeffrey was flying somewhere. So there was a love that existed between Jeffrey and Bonds. But I want to be very clear because there's, it's such a misunderstanding. My respect for Bonds as a player is not diminished by my lack of respect of him as a hitting coach or as a person. He was the most feared hitter we ever faced. He was the guy you never want to let beat you, who beat you every time anyway. We had so many conversations with our pitching staff going through that lineup when you're playing the Giants. Do not pitch to him. We were willing to walk him with the bases loaded, no problem. We knew he was on steroids. It doesn't matter because when you're playing a game, whoever is on steroids, if they're hitting a home run to beat you, you're going to lose the game. But all of this discourse about does that mean he should get a plaque in the plaque room in Cooperstown has completely missed the point of why he's not there. It's because of the way he carried himself, not just during his career, but after his career, his absolutely unwillingness to acknowledge what he did and why he did it other than to those quietly who he did admit to. That is the reason he did not get the votes. That doesn't in any way diminish what he was as a hitter during that period of time because he was the best I ever saw. Are you saying that Barry Bonds has admitted to steroid use? Are you dry snitching? Huh. What's a dry snitch? What you're doing right now, you're dry yep. snitching. I've never heard that expression. You're dry snitching. Are you? Well, what, what, what does it mean? Like you're you're revealing someone else's business in a more covert way. Private personal yeah, business. You're yeah. dry snitching yeah. on someone What's else. What's wet snitching? Just straight up saying Barry Bonds did steroids. Barry Bonds did steroids. Yeah, but you're <gasps> saying you're saying wow. but you saying you've heard him say he's done steroids is the dry snitching. Well, no, that if you say you well, hold heard on, him, isn't that like wet ba- snitching? Well, you're no, has Barry snitching. told you directly? Has he told you well, directly? No. I'm still trying to get to the bottom line of what you're saying is the difference. I'm still trying to wrap my head around Barry Bonds doing steroids. Yeah. Wait, you, you're trying to say that this is news to you? That he admitted it to somebody would be news. <gasps> no, it would not. Oh, yes, it would. Oh, yes, it would. Yeah, yeah, Greg Who? Anderson it was like... It went to jail. Time. Went to jail and got put in our friends Hall of Fame first ballot because he went to jail keeping that secret for Barry Bonds. To whom has he admitted it? And answer Stugatz's question: Has Barry Bonds told you that he did steroids? I'm not going to be drawn into a conversation about who said what to who and the difference between wet snitching and dry snitching. I'm merely going to tell you that there's not one person in the industry <laughs> of, in baseball who does not know that Barry Bonds did steroids. Not one. From, this is not news, folks. Yes You're or no. trying to create a headline. Okay. You're trying to make the, the title of your podcast The Local Hour with Adnan reviewing another crappy movie that he didn't even see for 25 minutes. I'm in. But whatever you want to title the episode, it's not about wet snitching, dry snitching, or the fact that, oh, my God, the epiphany of a lifetime, Barry Bonds did steroids. Are you kidding me? Are you accusing Adnan Burke of not 
watching these movies he reviews? Did he tell you that directly? <laughs> I'm gonna wet snitch Virk right now. His ability, the fact that you decided to make him a tent pole for your movie reviews with your new company is some sort of. Well, I don't want to talk. Cinephile released today. Chris Cody, the producer. What's Sounds on, like sour grapes to me. What's on it today? Adnan Verk will join us later in the show. Well, it's the Spit and Chickens episode, Dan. Yeah. Of course. So, we of course, all, right. all chickens in movie history. Mm -hmm. We're talking right. about them. Uh, oh, wow. From the uh, <clears throat> Barry Bonds perjury case, Wikipedia. Excuse me. Uh, he admitted to using the clear unknowingly. Unknowingly. Uh, I think what we're talking about here is. Uh, if O.J. Simpson, if we all think O.J. Simpson uh, committed that murder, that's one thing. But if I say O.J. told me he committed that yeah. murder, that's a story. And both yep. of those are equal Murders. stories. They're equal in size, yeah. both of those both. stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Please do not compare sticking a needle in your bum to killing your wife. I was being sarcastic. Yeah, it was, was a joke. joke. Go was ahead and joke. hit him with the you don't get the show, please. Hit him with a frying pan right How to the face. You, uh, uh, for the record, and I'll say this. You don't get the show. Uh, publicly, so that I don't get <laughs> aggregated, I was not saying that uh, the steroid allegation is as bad as murder. I was saying it's worse than murder. Much worse. Worse, yes, was. Okay. Yeah. worse than way murder. Worse. Glad you cleared yeah. that up. Brandon Marshall and Jason Taylor have a problem with you and what you said on the show last week. They reached out saying that you're crazy thinking that coaches should be able to touch the players even as Bruce Arians did. They were very mad at you. I'm crushed. <laughs> Here's a you clip have of no idea. My self-esteem has gone to nothing. I feel like I'm five foot five right now. <laughs> You'll never admit that you're wrong, but here's Mike Schur, um, highly regarded uh, writer of uh, small screen and big screen. I don't think he actually did movies. Here's Mike Schur <laughs> on his January <laughs> observation. I recently listened to a local hour and heard David Sampson take a bold and brave stance in favor of coaches hitting their players on the head. <laughs> you rarely hear the pro side of that argument. So I salute you, David Sampson, for standing up for what you believe in, which in this case was that coaches should be allowed to hit their players on the head. You know what the I in David stands for, Dan? It stands for, I think it's fine when coaches hit their players on the head. David Sampson appearing in a documentary about Woody Hayes. <laughs> Collision course. Um, Mike, what are the what are the beeps that happen in between? Is that you editing his stuff together because he didn't actually say that? Can you take me behind get, the get, scenes? Get the, of how you much don't you get the show, show again because David Sampson Matter doesn't listen you. to anything that we do around here. You don't here. get the show. It is just Stugatz's observations. I don't even remember why that started. Do you? Do you remember, Mike? Why we started with the beeps? What was the inception? Because you took notes on a game. It was this one specific game that you ran notes through. I blurted out to you guys that I had taken notes on the notes uh, on the note app on my iPhone, and you guys you asked remember? me to. Yeah. What was the game though? Do you remember? I um, wish I could, I could find the first. One. What were the beeps though? Why were the we beeps? A transition. Were, but were they from the show? At no, one point was overproduced. Yeah, Mike didn't realize I had so many observations, and so I just started reading them, and he needed a way to break them up, and so he decided to go with the beep. That's let's uh, let's go back to what it is we were talking about, David. Uh, just to, to get in, you said you don't respect Barry Bonds as a person. I do not. No. Because he was that bad to people? When, when you don't respect someone, that, that's for reasons. You can't not respect someone who you don't know. Let's start with that. Because all of the vitriol that you see on social media and all the people who are in this industry who talk about people who they really don't know at all, my, my experiences with Barry Bonds are based on my personal experiences with Barry Bonds that I actually had, conversations I had, moments I had, and respect of someone and their ability is different than respecting someone and what they stand for, how they act, and the things they say. I have great respect for his hand-eye coordination and his ability to hit a baseball. 
What I don't respect about him is actually quite simple. It's the way he carries himself and the way he makes everything about him when he's in a team atmosphere, the way he is in a clubhouse, the way he is as a coach, the way he treated the game, and then how badly he wanted to get back in the game by being a hitting coach, taking advantage of an owner who genuflected in his general direction, thinking that that would in any way bolster his Hall of Fame candidacy, number one. Number two, that it would somehow make it so he could be the reclamation project that A-Rod has become. And the reason why Bonds was never able to do that, and the best he got yesterday was that ridiculous statement by the San Francisco Giants, which on a recent episode of Nothing Personal, I dissected because it was an absolute disgrace what the San Francisco Giants did when they released what they released about Bonds after not getting into the Hall of Fame, but so obvious why they did it. The re- that's why I have a lack of respect for him. So just be clear that he can change, but he's not going to. You can earn someone's respect. You can gain someone's respect. But for him to do it, he needs to stand up and explain to you and to all of his teammates and to everyone in the media why he did the things he did. That would give me increased respect for him. I should tell the audience, I did not at the beginning, that the David Sampson podcast is something that you should be listening to. Nothing personal with David Sampson. It will give you a lot of business insight as well as insights all around sports in places that aren't business. But as an executive, you should know it's a very unique look into the world if you're interested in that part of the world. Following up on that, David, uh, Major League Baseball talks, uh, ongoing uh, discussions trying to get a deal done. Some good news, some bad news? There's been no bad news. Okay, so it's all good news. We're going to have baseball. Yeah, well, Well, that's the the bad bad news. In your your mind, what was the bad news? That we're going to have baseball. Okay, now listen, if that's your point of view, then I'm with you. Then it's all bad news because there will be a season. What's going on now is negotiating 101 where proposals are being sent back and forth. Very often the proposals are made knowing they're not going to be accepted. You put a position out there knowing where you are going. We talked about this. Maybe it was on this show. Maybe it was not. Maybe it was on my show where I explained what you do, what you have in front of you as a piece of paper, and on an issue, just take the minimum salary because that's the easiest to digest in a short period of time because you've got to get to Adnan because he's going to review Stir Crazy with Richard Pryor. You have, that's a chicken movie, isn't it? So you have a minimum <laughs> salary, which is at $570,000. The players want seven seventy five dollars per year for their players, and you want to do 600000 So you have a piece of paper with what the bid is, what the ask is, and what you're willing to settle at. So in very easy terms, when you're negotiating, and I don't know if you guys negotiate your salaries with Skipper or Bimmel or maybe with Lebitard himself, but you obviously don't immediately go to what you're willing to settle for. You ask for more. That's negotiating 101, and that's what's going on with all of these issues in collective bargaining. There will be a deal. It just won't be today because it doesn't have to be today. I have another question. You all right? You're a little, you're a little salty. How you doing? You okay? We uh, buoy your spirits. You're just uh, coming in guns hot. And, you know, we're just uh, perhaps we're being mean to making content mic, amongst friends. And maybe you took the, the Mike Sure thing uh, a little. I think it was the Adnan thing. Yeah. yeah. I you, mean, he came right? after Adnan. Yeah, no, but I, but I think he doesn't like I introduced that uh, Adnan will be talking about the Hall of Fame with us later in the show there as part of that, his yeah. introduction. Is it something that I'm doing? I, I'm, I'm sorry. I just want to. I just think that the way you guys promote Adnan makes me laugh as though he is your guy to go to for these things so and good. and and there's so many people who who have a microphone who have a platform who have not actually done anything but you like Adnan. And what i try to do is be the person who has done something and uses his platform to educate people who don't have to agree with me i don't care if people like me or disagree with me i care if you're not educated on a subject jeter and adnan big fans samson is it, I don't care what? about Jeter. Are you Yoda? What what? Good well question. Good question. Good question. Yoda. What a statement. Yoda. It, it, Chris Cody has decided he's going to now answer, ask questions as Yoda. Uh, it's Thursday, Chris. It's a dangerous game. Did you say, I'm, I want to be clear on what your last sentence was there. Uh, did you say that Adnan doesn't know what he's talking about? Wait, are we still live? 
We are. I want to clear up we, Chris's we, last we've sentence. We've lost Chris Cody because they're all <laughs> laughing at him in the shipping container. They've fallen. Some of them have fallen on the floor laughing. Chris Cody is leaking confidence right now. He doesn't know why he said it that way. <laughs> Knew what I was doing, I was. <laughs> I did. You're back. I did. <laughs> Chris, I think you're amazing because you are making chicken salad out of chicken shit. Thank you, David. <laughs> <laughs> I can't and then we'll you review got that. It wrong the second time. And I thought he got it right. <laughs> David, I saw that uh, Apple and you and John Skipper. I encourage you guys to listen to when John Skipper and David get together to talk business. You and John Skipper have talked about the streaming wars and how many billions of dollars are coming to live sports now. But the report the other day that Apple is going to be spending billions, you know, billions plus. I don't even know how you arrive at billions plus. It's not something I'd seen before, but everything's got a plus now. And <laughs> Apple is saying billions plus on live sports. It's, the reports are. Can you tell me what's happening there and how big they're, you expect them to get into this game? So do you know how when Michael Jordan would gamble and people were just awestruck that he would golf and gamble $350,000 a hole. And when you did the math based on his salary, it's the equivalent of us going on the DraftKings app and betting like $15 on a game. Like no one's gonna get upset when you're betting $15. So Michael Jordan can bet $350,000. So when Apple does a billions plus and they do everything with plus, you know, Apple TV plus, right? So when you do releases, you're trying to get into the minds of people who are listening in a subliminal way, you do it as plus. Billions plus to Apple is like Metalark investing, you know, a million dollars in talent. It is not the end of the world. It's not going to cause a complete supply chain breakdown to your P&L statement. What it will do, however, by Apple agreeing to get in this space is they want to compete with Amazon. They want to get into the last remaining vestige of what people will pay for to watch live in what we all know as DVR-proof content. Therefore, for them to be bidders and use some of their market cap, which is generated through iPhone sales and all the different ways that we engage Apple, Apple and Amazon are in a fight for our lives. They want every part of what we do. Think about what you do with Apple right now. They want it all because when they have it all, that's when the billions become trillions, become gazillions. To do it, you've got to have people on your platform watching live sports. It's why Amazon is in the game and why the networks like ESPN are going to struggle because they do not have the market cap, they do not have the wherewithal to compete in this arena. I'm asking you as well, though, for some of the details on what you expect it to look like because Apple is making these giant movies now. Tom Hanks has released two movies on Apple. They, Tom, they basically bought him from the movie industry because they want whatever Tom Hanks brings. So what's going over there? Like, what's going to change for the fan? What do you imagine it means that they're getting in the game or want to get in the game this way? It's called $5.99 a month for Apple TV+. Plus. Think about what, what ESPN is, is two years away from having games on ESPN+. Plus. You've got Amazon. You have to have Amazon Prime if you want to watch a Thursday night game. So you sign up for Amazon Prime, and the next thing you know, you've got Charmin Ultra Soft Toilet Paper at your door. If you have Apple TV+, Plus, not only are you watching Tom Hanks, you're getting live sports, but then you log in with your Apple ID, and then they get at you with Apple One, Apple Care, Apple iPhone, all of that. Let me so let me let sure me ask let question. me ask the question a different way. What are they going to buy? Like, what are they going to put behind their wall that's going to make us go over there? What has value? Well, first of all, any sort of ML, all the four major sports add from a European standpoint. You can add soccer. You can add any of the, the tournament that's going now in Africa while there are coups going on while a tournament is happening. Right, that is still content that is basically swallowed by the rest of the world. So they are gonna bid for any sort of that content. It doesn't matter what it is. Anytime there's a package that's up, which is why ESPN and other networks are trying to get long-term deals, but Apple has a horizon that doesn't go five years or 10 years like these deals. Apple's horizon goes into the next century. 
So they're willing to wait however long it takes because, for me, they love to get rid of Fox. They love to get rid of CBS and ESPN and just have everyone watching every sport on all of the Apple platforms. One more way I'll ask it. You run Apple. You go after right now trying to make the splashes. Not just everything. You go after what? What are you going after because you want splash in, in this game in a way that's substantive? The same way ESPN started with curling, right? If you are starting, you go after and you overpay for anything that's available. That's how they got Tom Hanks, that you see they're doing it with movies. Why is Adam McKay doing a movie for Netflix with Leonardo DiCaprio? What is the reason, Dan? The reason is because Netflix is liquid. That's, so that, that's the end of the story. Can you review this week's movie for us? Tell us what you're going to review. Yeah, so this is don't turn off your, your, your podcast, please. I want to talk about, and I hope we have time, but I don't want to get in Adnan's way here, but I want to talk about a movie called Flea, and it is an extremely important movie that's going to be nominated not just for Best Animated Feature, but for Best Documentary and Best Foreign Feature. It is a movie about refugees, and, a, and it's a true story, and it's done with a combination. of Has anyone on this show seen the movie Flea? No. I just Googled Have, it, and I got the Red Hot Chili Peppers guy. That's really outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what to say. It's about an Afghan <laughs> refugee as a kid who was forced to flee Afghanistan, ends up in Russia, has to be trafficked from Russia over to Europe. On top of that, he's gay, and it goes through his life. And it's a true story with obviously names changed, and it is a tragic tale that forget white privilege just how about united states privilege how about being born in this country with a passport without needing to be a refugee and this goes beyond homelessness this goes beyond racism this is what happens when you are in a third world country where there is war that is financed by the united states by the way that results in kids having to flee families being broken up not temporarily but permanently and on this National Holocaust Remembrance Day, it's important to remember it's not just Jews who have been persecuted and been the subject of genocide, but many, many people, and it's still happening. It's an important movie, and I don't want to get too serious, and I certainly would never want to do anything to upset Chris, but I will say that if you have not watched Flea, uh, you're making a mistake because it's a very, very important watch. It's only 89 minutes, and it's executive produced by Riz Ahmed which I found interesting. I'm not sure the connection there. I'm not sure if they just used his name after his recent success or whatever the case is, but it's a brilliantly done movie that also has live footage of what happened in Afghanistan. So it mixes anime and live in a way that I had not seen before. It's original, it is thought provoking, it is incredibly difficult to watch, but more important than it is difficult. I am flabbergasted in that I did not think it possible within a 20, 25-minute period for anyone on our show to feel greater shame than what Chris Cody felt after falling on his face with his Yoda. But Jessica, once she heard you talking about that subject matter, that serious subject matter, dropped her head in her hands because of how she heard Flea, which is the same way I heard Flea when you started. I thought Flea, and when you said Flea and animated, I was imagining a cartoon uh, Flea. Yeah, I spelled it with an A, and then I Googled it, and I couldn't find any movies named Flea until then. Yeah, this subject, and then <laughs> I regretted I, I, my It happened to me, too. Just yeah. trust that I didn't know until he started talking about the subject matter that he was talking about Flea with two E's. Yeah. And oh. I watched Flea with two E's on Apple TV Plus and rented it for five ninety nine just to bring this in full circle. Well, that doesn't bring this in full circle. This brings it in full circle. Segment went well, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. <laughs> you can't give me time to think about a you line. Messed that one up. <laughs> you just got to let it fly, right? right? I, he I wasn't better when I'm just like, small window, boom. All right. <laughs> what do you describe as better? Oh. Uh. Funny. <laughs> it's the secret portal that they all get. It's his dad's portal, too. It's funnier when I'm right. just honestly bad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, South Florida sports was a punchline for such a long time, guys. It was just so bad. We were so desperate for a winner. And we were annoying folks talking about Hassan Whiteside teams just... Ah. 
just reeking of dis uh, desperation, wanting to matter the way that we did. And then we cut to 2022. And right now, presently, the Miami Heat are first place in their conference. Uh. The Florida Panthers are first place in their conference. Oh, yeah. The Miami Hurricanes men's basketball team is first place in their conference. We're the sports capital of the country. <laughs> we are back. Our football team stink, but who cares? We haven't even annoyed you with it. We've been very good this hockey season and hoop season. We've been so good at not talking about them and annoying you, but now we're going to crush you over our knees because we got title contenders, at least in the pro side, definite title contenders. I don't think Stugat saw. I can make an argument for what happened with the University of Miami basketball team last night, that that's one of the most fun endings I've ever seen. Just the the exit. I don't think Stugatz has seen any of this. I have not. No. All right, so they're playing at Virginia Tech. The game is tied, and they win it on a half-court heave. They win it. The game is tied, mm -hmm. and they win it at the buzzer with a shot that's taken from a ridiculous length. And then... As the bench floods the floor, Stugatz, to celebrate the game winner right? in shock and awe and amazement, like you will when you're not expecting to make a shot from that distance, in a stunned arena, stunned, they all just run right off the court. Everybody just runs right off the court into the tunnel. The celebration was never on the court. It was just sort of like, let's run, let's get out of here. And they left an empty, haunted arena filled with quiet people. <laughs> and you could just, I, I, it, like that Are you one, telling me they all got out of the arena? They all I, went into the they, tunnel? They all, they That's all, a badass they, way of they, doing they, it. They never, yes. got to the, they never got to the celebrator. They never got to the shot maker. <laughs> They, they they tried to get to him, but he ran them right off the court in, into the tunnel. And if you listen to it with the, with the sound up, it's even better. It's funny as a visual, but listening to the silence is even better. What are you smiling about, Mike? Are we listening on the radio or the TV? Well, I was on mute, obviously. <laughs> no, okay. Because uh, okay. uh, I'm wondering what, what Half Court was sponsored by on the Joe Z broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> Were you watching, Mike? Was uh, I watching? Golden yeah. came, oh. Mike. You came in with a University of Miami jacket today. It's Big not even cold sky. anymore. It's not even cold. Uh, that, pardon me. It is currently 45 degrees in the studio. It's a little chilly outside, Dan. It is. It's chilly I mean, in the studio. It's not, not outside. chilly outside. My nose has been bit. running all morning. It is not. This is not chilly. You are offending. America listens to this, man. <laughs> in the studio, Dan, it is... 30 degrees with the wind chill. <laughs> Mike Ryan's jacket. I'm, I'm, not, I'm having a hard time explaining what this is. It's a bit of a Happy Days uh, sweater, like a Letterman's just a track jacket. sweater. Just uh, a track jacket. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, a, yeah. Yeah. He's worn it before. But to celebrate the victory last night, correct? Yeah, well, I always rep my uh, my university in Miami that I did not go to, but I pay enough to. Uh, I love <laughs> Kane's hoops. It's uh, I, I went to the UNC game. I went to the FSU game. I am back like I never left six years ago. Why are they not ranked? They're in the ACC. They've beaten Duke. They've beaten Carolina. Why are they not ranked? Every time they, they're they about to be ranked, they slip up against FSU, who lost to Georgia Tech, which is why the Miami Hurricanes men's basketball team sits atop the uh, ACC conference, which is a very weird conference this year. FSU is a matchup problem for Miami. I hope to not see them in the postseason tournament, even though they've only lost those games by a combined two points. But they got a real good team. Uh, Wong is among the leaders in points per game in the conference. Charlie Moore is skyrocketing up the uh, all-time assist record list. You, you're going to look at Charlie Moore, especially with that moment last night, as maybe perhaps one of the greatest men's hoopers to come <laughs> through this program. It says more about the program than it does Charlie Moore, but I don't want to take anything away from the guy. He's a, he's a good player. And again, another opportunity for a public apology, sincere one, to Jim Laranega, because this team is really fun to watch. Uh, they're very well coached, and you need to have uh, – back to Charlie Moore for a second. You need to have a really good point guard for Jim Laranega's style. We saw it with Shane Larkin down here in years prior. Uh, we, we've seen it uh, when Miami has had success. That high pick and roll is so essential to this system. And Charlie Moore, 
and the guard play of Wong, that backcourt of Wong and Moore. Well, and they've got really the cartoonishly comedic great name of Cameron McGusty. McGusty yeah. is a real right. McGusty. Yeah, it's a really nice. <laughs> what what is what are you doing with your eyebrows McGusty. right? <laughs> Jessica, <laughs> Jessica, <laughs> finds you the, have to do it. The She's name right, yeah. alluring for some reason. Is this team legitimately good though? I'm saying this as someone who has admittedly not watched a second of Kane. Well, they basketball. weren't. They weren't the first ten games of the season. They looked not just below average. They didn't look like they had anything special. Or, or I was, I'm just kind of getting at, or is this kind of like a nice team, but they get in and, you know, you're first seven round and two in the ACC, man. Dude, but they, they, they've had good ACC seasons. This has Panthers vibes where it's like, we kind of seen good seasons, but it's like, it doesn't really not, mean they're anything. They're not that good. The FSU, Mike is right. That's a matchup nightmare for them. I think FSU is simply better. And to your question, can they do that by 25 to North Carolina in the tournament? Can they win on the road against Duke in the tournament? No, they're not. They can might, they beat they, the they, Fighting they Irish on February they, 2nd? They can win those games. They don't have to do that in the tournament. It's neutral courts. They've not, beaten not, Duke on no, the road, but, and Carolina's not making the tournament. But they're bad. Remains, can you it, beat Duke in the tournament or the likes of What Duke? Chris right. Cody's question really is though and this is a legitimate one is the panthers this year are indisputably in hockey anyone watching hockey is like oh they're really good yes top of the food chain good they can beat anybody that's not this university of miami basketball team it's not that it doesn't mean they can't win the acc it doesn't mean they can't get to the sweet 16 it just means so they're that overachieving you're, you're not watching this and saying oh my god this is zion cam reddish and you know and barrett at duke that's not what you're watching but worse teams have made it to the final four i mean they have really I mean, that's what that's march madness is all about that's what it's all about I mean, if you, if you, like george mason made it to the uh, the final go. four Loyola. But, but you're just doing what are you doing, prestige? Yep. Because that Loyola team was really good. Yeah, that George debatable. Mason team was really good. Yeah. I, I, Miami is good. and They're a tournament team. I don't, yeah, it would, I, seem, it would but, appear so. But I don't think it matters. Well, seed. The, the question well, is, Can yes. they win the ACC regular season, uh, but, regular season title? I think Chris's question is the one, though, Mike. When I th look at this team, I see a six or a seven or an eight seed. I do not see the one or a two or a three uh, seed. That I might may. be what you see. But if they win the ACC and have a deep run in the ACC tournament, they're going to be a three or four seed. If That's I what they'll may. be. And then they'll lose. Can we okay. stop with they have to win a title for you guys to recognize them? They are about to right now. They are poised to win a title. Your focus should be, uh, unlike football or, or anything else, like the, the expectations for men's basketball is if you win your conference, that is worth throwing a parade over. I'm telling you. No, that's fair. Who cares what, what happens? Like, that's why they have banners for Sweet 16 appearances. Is this the best team in the nation? I doubt Mike, it. Mike, but this is what he's doing, okay? And Luther Campbell complained about this on Twitter because at the Heat game, he's like, man, I see a whole lot of rappers show up when the Heat are in first place. I see a whole lot of rappers who aren't from here all of a sudden attach themselves to Heat stuff. Jessica went to her first Heat game last night. I want to talk to her about that. But uh, Mike is right in what he's saying. But Chris is also right in this respect, Mike. If you want Miami to actually pay attention to this, you better tell them they're that kind of good. You're right saying, no, man, winning the ACC is a huge achievement, and if Miami ever does that, that's a good destination on any season. But if you want Miami to pay attention, front-runner Miami, to pay attention, you got to be the kind of good the Panthers are. you got to be the kind of good that Chris wants this Hurricane team to be, which is, can they win it all? Can they take me on a ride? Can you, have, can you point to the TV and say, well, that guy's a pro prospect? Uh, Wong might have a, a pro career, but there there isn't that. Even when Miami was paying attention to the Miami Hurricanes basketball team with the team that won the double, the regular season and postseason ACC tournament, you knew Shane Larkin was going to get a look in the pros. They had some they had some good players that you could project out. Is this team that? No, college basketball has kind of changed, and a veteran backcourt, as Sue Gods would always tell us, yep. when he does his uh, his uh, March Madness. Very previous. important March, Dan. Look, you got a well-coached team that has a system. That system is run very well by a veteran backcourt. And whether or not they make a deep run in the tournament does not matter to me. I'm really enjoying absolutely beating the brakes off of North Carolina at home. I'm really enjoying this run because it's unexpected. An unexpected underdog, maybe Miami follows, follows this bandwagon into the tournament, but it doesn't matter to me. 
You win the ACC, that is a massive achievement. I get wanting to win the ACC first, but just not like it's a little bit of a loser's mentality here. With I don't care, like I just feel win like the conference. I'm seeing get three, three right now, and right. I'm seeing that you don't think they can win in the tournament. No, so you're no like, I don't. The I don't ACC I, is all we kind of have, so it's all I'm really caring. But Chris, about. here's but what's yeah, going to happen, Mike. But if they win the ACC, your expectations are going to grow. They're going to be a three or a four seed, and then if they get bounced out first or second round of the tournament, you're going to be upset. ESPN's been, ESPN's been doing this thing where they have like live bracketology. <laughs> on the graphic and just with one one point loss to fsu miami tumbled uh from an eight seed to a 10 seed you lose a game you lose that game against virginia tech and you might be first four out the acc is weird right now saying you're atop the conference right now doesn't have that much cachet to people that follow the sport because the the conference but, has been really but bizarre talent wise what you're willing to say and this is a huge jump here Mike Ryan is gone in a month or six weeks or two months from being super critical of the head coach to telling you now, and he's right, that they're like a seven or an eight seed. Like they're a team that in the tournament, and, and maybe they win the tournament and get to a six seed and anything else, but they're good enough to be a legitimate t- tournament team. And the ACC is weird. They might lose their next seven games. This is games. such an odd conversation. I've weird. never heard yeah. a team discussed on. in this way. It's like, this is a good team. But don't ease up on the tournament. We've never had an ACC like this. <laughs> yeah. And you can, you can blame I the pandemic. I know, but Duke's still a top five team. And they won at Duke, so I don't know what – I'm not going to – do you want me to be a fanboy and say I like their chances in the tournament? Because I, I don't. I want you to say we're going well, to a Final Four. But, Mike, what, what – It doesn't matter The to story me. is how weird the ACC is, and that's now what I'm kind of learning through. Because usually you think college basketball, ACC champion – that's a, t- a top no, five contender. Weekend. Miami's good, right. though. It's a one it's, seed, But it's right. all weekend. Many of these guys are going pro earlier. College basketball in general is diluted. Right, but all conferences are going through the same thing, right? Not just the ACC, the Big Ten, the Big 12, the Pac-12. I mean. If you can't win your conference tournament and feel good about your team, then what is the point of any of this? What's the point of having a conference? Like, it's a big deal to win the conference championship. But what Chris is asking, I don't want to speak for him, but I really do think that the casual Miami fan that always makes March Madness last in the ratings in South Florida is entitled and going over to the television and asking before they make the emotional investment, hey, can I expect a championship here? That can is I, what I'm doing, kind of. Like, yeah, should I watch this the next should, few I start Do around? I really need to start paying attention here because you're telling me that the nation is looking at Miami and saying that's a championship team? And the answer to that question is no. I do love a half-court game winner. Like last night's result, I was like, okay. I could do this, <laughs> Who but it's a lot of commitment. That? It's like, these, like, am I going to go to the Wasco Center? I don't think so. It's a lot. Like, it's, is, they got to win more. Let me know what's going to happen. Yeah, here. there it Tell is. In Enti- traffic too. Enti- I'll go to the <laughs> ACC tournament game. All right, maybe I'll go to the semifinal ACC. That's not going to be here though. Damn it. Now, if Dan told you they were a national championship contender, or Mike told you that, would you go down for a game? <laughs> <laughs> he is his father's son entitled and spoiled jessica how was your first heat game experience they mopped the floor start to finish with the knicks last night do you want my honest take on it no lie to us jessica <laughs> oh no do you do you want the, the hard truth dan sure way too many kids there oh, really? there were at least eight kids under the age of 10 just in the row behind me she's always anti-kid then like three mm. kids in the row in front of me everywhere i walked there were kids everywhere right i didn't know so many kids went to nba games was it children's you, night you were i'm sporting. not even talking about tyler hero by the, the way i'm talking about actual kids <laughs> there were kids everywhere that's how it works that's, kids, kids like basketball too parents yeah. take their kids to games look i've I mean. been to a, a lot of I, I can give you my sports attendance bona fides Ooh. bona fides but i've never seen this many children and I haven't seen children, honestly, since before the pandemic. Mm. Just in general, it was jarring. Can you pull up your seats? Just pull up your seats. Okay, pull up my seats. Were you expecting? Were you expecting a more where you were sitting? A more adult experience? Were you expecting? I mean, something? honestly, yeah. I thought like, like Mike told me they play this song in the fourth quarter. That's like a yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that song. And the people <laughs> dance and like get lit. Everyone I was like, oh, this out. is gonna be like a nightclub vibe. It's Miami. It's the heat. Like I, I as I was walking in, I saw a bunch of people in nightclub attire. So I was like, oh, this is gonna be a party. And then there were just children everywhere. Yeah, only one team showed up. That's why that happened. But Mike, why are you asking where she was sitting? Because, because that might have something to do with the kids. I, 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 well, I'm thinking that perhaps is it a price difference? Is it a section difference? I don't know where Mike's. If if you specifically do not want to see kids at a sporting event, which is a bizarre request, (laughs) that's weird. uh, There are places you can go inside that arena, places you can sit in sections where you won't have to worry about kids. I was in section 114. 
That's my bad. FTX Arena bona fides. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Really okay. good seats, actually. Were kids what? on like Rum Springa? Like, I don't understand. I don't understand either. There were just kids. I, I even told my, I was like, there's a lot of kids here, right? And she was like, yeah, there's a lot. Was of there kids. a kids' halftime show or a kids' no, for the performance? Nothing or like, there was a kid sitting behind me, Dan, who was asleep the entire time, so, passed out. And his father was taking selfies and was trying to wake him up for the selfie, but the kid was just passed were out. Were they Knicks fans or Heat fans? Honestly, split. Hmm. Were I'll, you disappointed? Were you disappointed? That there were so many no, children? In, yes. Uh, well, no, that's obvious. Thank you. But were you disappointed in the though. evening? No, I mean, it was it was nice. Like, it was fine. It was, it, it's a fine. nice arena. There's like a nice outdoor Ooh, patio. Nice. That sounded. I haven't, boring. honestly, I haven't been to an NBA game in years, probably since the last time the Bulls were good. But yeah, there were, it was, it was a nice time. I, I will say on top of there being a lot of kids, the men to women ratio was like 300 to one. Not a lot of women? There were no women that's there. A, that's a Knicks game. That's thing. weird. Yeah. It was that's weird. weird. Is that the playoffs, no though? Is that I mean, Wall Street? No, but wait a minute. Uh, no, wait that's a minute. just like Knicks fans. Uh, there were a lot of Knicks fans there. I could hear them over ton the of Knicks There fans, were yeah. a ton of Knicks fans. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe that's what it, it didn't was. didn't work out well for them. Because that, our, our experience in Miami is it is more of a party, and the, man, uh, the male-to-female ratio is absolutely not that because it's very much of a be-seen place for men and women. It's Do a... You, it's, uh, Heat Did games. Hide? What's that? <laughs> the nightclub. Uh, night There's a nightclub no under kids. the. Under. Why did no anyone kids. tell me this? Do they like? Is it 21 and older? They don't like you. kids in there. What? Forget I, about seeing kids Jesus. at the games. I barely saw basketball at the games when I had season tickets. I was just always down there and hide. There are nightclubs and there are a couple of lounges too. Flagship lounges that are high end, luxury, and more of the heat game feel of we're all here to flirt with each other. See, and that's what I was looking for, Dan. I was looking for a little gotta like go to hide. a little funsy. But you didn't go to the funsies. nightclub. You went to the I didn't the know there bound, was a nightclub. Of the course there was a night. How did I not know there was a nightclub? <laughs> How is it that Jessica ends up in a Miami Heat game on a Knicks Heat night, which still brings something to the arena, and ends up having a bounce house kitty experience? <laughs> you laugh at those pathetic New York Knicks. By the way, I love the team petty stuff that the Miami Heat social team did with a, a Chris Bosch appreciation because gas bag Northeasterners wanted to go out with a hot take that Julius Randle was better than Chris Bosch <laughs> ever was last year. And I told you, you're getting played by this journeyman. He's been bad this year, yeah, man. No, he's, he's yeah. been bad yeah. this year. He's largely been Julius Randle his entire career. You caught lightning. Well, you know in a what? Bottle. He's been Julius Randle his entire career. I mean, I'll last say, year he was good. Down. I mean, last year he was no, good. I will no, remind no, you guys. My point, is, my point right. is that his name, he hasn't legally oh, changed the okay. whole entire time he has been Julius Randle. And last year he was cusp of all star good. You deserve this, by the way. Why? You, for an entire year. What you, did I do? Ben Stiller, uh, WFAN, you were gassing up <laughs> this guy. Just a guy, yeah. good player, some qualities, a contributor. You gassed him up to Chris Bosh levels. You absolutely deserve the bottom falling out on him for being this stupid. Mike, perhaps we got carried away. But perhaps. when you've been so bad for so long, you'll take anything. And last I year, I mean, last year we got to the playoffs. It was exciting. And I remember you guys saying on the air when they were playing playoff games at Madison Square Garden, oh, man, we kind of missed that. Like, we need the Knicks to be good. The NBA is better when the Knicks are good. So I, I got carried that. away last year. I never said that. I believe Dan said it at no, one point. What, I never what, said that. What, what, I said, what I said is I spent a lot of time laughing yes. at the general enthusiasm <laughs> for the winning of a – they spilled into the street. Yeah. For the winning of a single playoff game at the, Mecca, at the Mecca. Yeah. And the bottom has fallen out because their starting lineup is one of the worst in the league. Thibodeau keeps wanting to play his bench because his bench that? plays defense. Well, Kemba Walker's been terrible. Like the plus you... minus. Tommy Breer always puts it out. The plus minus for the starting lineup as opposed to the bench. It is always such a stark contrast. The bench is so much better than those guys you're starting the game with. Kemba was minus 30 last night. This is not a surprise. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, <laughs> what, what do you expect of Kemba Walker? What do you expect of Julius Randle? Like, I enjoyed... The Knicks being air quotes back just because it gave me an opportunity to laugh at a bunch of people that were gassing up Julius Randle <laughs> and Kemba Walker and saying bing bong.
<laughs> as Spider-Man drinks from a Henny bottle. They like, got that, so that, excited. They got so well, excited. They embarrassed, they embarrassed themselves in the playoffs, though. I'm a, I'm a 36-year-old man. I've seen a couple of professional championship teams in my day. I know what a championship team looks like. It doesn't look like Julius Randle. It doesn't look like Kemba Walker. It doesn't look like Spider-Man. You didn't think it looked bottle. like Jimmy Butler five years ago. <laughs> in fact, I mean, you, sorry. In fact, that team is so New York because it's such a mid-city that they actually look like they're playing okay. basketball All with right. Timberlands. At least there's not <laughs> freaking kids everywhere at the Garden. Oh, what, what is this? What is kids oh, doing? she's kids. defensive on behalf of Knicks fan. Are you a Knicks? Is this what I'm you're... not a Knicks fan. I just yeah, that, I didn't expect to spend my night Glory with like Hunter. 3, Mid City got her. The Mid City was a trigger. Yeah, Mid City. Mid City. I didn't like that. And you can't spell Mid. Well, you can't spell Madison Square Garden <laughs> without <laughs> the Mid. <laughs> Quote me. Just like that. You can't spell Mid. Dot dot dot. No, wait. You can't spell Madison Square Garden without the mid. Stugatz, when you say perhaps we got carried away, can we just send Stugatz a couple of those videos of what Knicks fans were doing outside of Madison Square Garden? You were responsible Garden? for a COVID spike <laughs> I mean, because they, you made the playoffs. They were bouncing <laughs> off of each other. The streets were filled of uh, just New York. That was the Deer District. Leave Knicks fans alone. No, okay? the, you, you had super spreaders spill it out to the streets because Julius Randle made a corner three, <laughs> and you guys thought you were hot shit. It is amazing to... Why are you guys coming after me today? Not only that, I mean... <laughs> you elevated Trey Young as if he were Reggie Miller when he's sitting down there with you at the bottom of the conference. Uh, they won six you're straight. Just I mean, gassing up all these guys that took advantage of a of an NBA season without a readily available vaccine. A lot of teams were brutalized because those that made deep runs in the previous season because of the bubble right. were at the short end of the sick with the luck. In the following year, it was a fake ass season, and your fake ass team made the most of it. One of the things I love about their fake ass team is it because this is something that has happened this season after bouncing in the streets with joy on playoff winning. There was a clamoring when he was benched. Kemba Walker was benched. Where people you're asking, why do they keep doing that? Why do they keep running out this starting lineup that has Julius Randle is minus 34, PJ Tucker is plus 37. <laughs> Why do they keep doing this set of lineups where Kemba can't play defense and Thibodeau's about defense and they're not good defensively? They're that starting lineup, I think, I haven't checked in like the last two weeks, but was the worst in the league, that starting lineup at just defending. They're they had like a, they were giving up points per possession at a They host, were last week they were the worst in the league. I yeah. do have but, to give you a break though. Derek Rose is out. But it's, it's Eric not, Rosen, 2022, is out. Not just person. worst in the league, Stugatz. Worst ever. Like, just a horrific starting lineup. But for a while, Mike, those people enthusiastic in the streets were clamoring for, you've got to uncage Kemba, Thib. Thibs. Why did, you, why did you bench Kemba? You've benched Kemba. So Kemba was supposed to come back and be a savior. And, you know, it, that has, it just has to hurt that New York... Stugatz got its hopes to there, and now, and hell, I was saying the Knicks were good earlier this season. I was saying, right. well, that team's going to be good, right? I thought they were going to be good. I mm -hmm. didn't think the the bottom was going to fall out of you it. You figure like a five or a six seed in the East, right? But Same I, as last year, kind of. But I didn't have right. Charlotte being now 150 points last night. I didn't have some of Cleveland. I didn't have Cleveland, Cleveland being. Cleveland's been a surprise. Yeah, They're crazy. Legit right. good. But and the I, Bulls are really good. But Chicago, uh, I had being better, playoff right. good. I didn't have them being top of the conference good. Adding Demar Derozan. Well, the thing is, we we probably entering this season, we probably should have taken inventory of all the teams that really improved the offseason that were kind of right there. Not what was it a game that separated the Knicks and the Heat last year in terms of uh, like the matchup that they got. I mean, you look at the Heat; they had a huge roster turnover. They absolutely improved. Chicago absolutely improved. You got to project with teams like Charlotte. You weren't that much better than these teams last year. And when they get better and your your whole thing is built on Julius Randle doing that again, of course this is what happens. When you do the thing with the Knicks roster and you're like, I look at that guy, that guy, he's not a, that's not a championship team. Don't you do that with the Bulls? I know they've had a good season so far, but DeMar DeRozan, no, Zach because, Levine, But Levine Lonzo has Ball. grown and Ball has grown, and that's a young team on the come up. But and DeRozan's but, good. But they're a, middle, they're a middle of the conference team. Like they, 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 that's play what hard. I was like. Yeah. They play hard. I think they'll be a really tough out in the postseason because they have guys that kind of excel when the game gets tight in the postseason. I meant middle of the conference playoffs, by the way. Yeah. I but meant to, like a four or five. If you peel back the layers on their advanced numbers, they're kind of punching above their weight class right now. They shouldn't be this good, and it's because guys like DeMar DeRozan are stepping up and in, in crucial moments and turning else dubs.
But to Chris's point, I think they'd play the Sixers in the first round right now, and I think you would probably take the Sixers, no? Very curious to see what the Sixers do because I happen, I, and I've led the charge on talking shit about the Sixers, but I think Joel Embiid should be MVP. I think he's playing he's brilliantly. Yeah. If they get anything for Ben Simmons uh, at near the deadline, anything that can help, they're also going to improve. I think this is one of the better Sixers teams despite the standings not reflecting it. I always think this one's interesting, right? Many, many years ago, uh, you had Bill Simmons floating what was then the Patrick Ewing theory, where you took Patrick Ewing out of a lineup and all of a sudden the Knicks aren't as bad as you thought they would be, and it's a little confusing sometimes in the NBA. And you've heard me use this example since the Sacramento Kings. Like the way they fell apart was that's a championship good team with Weber, with Stojakovic, with Divac, with Bibby. And then they lose one piece, and then they're a two or three seed, and then they lose another piece, they're a five seed, and then they're an eight seed, but you're like, and it's only Bibby out there, and you're like, holy shit, Bibby's so damn good, I had no idea. And Bede's been this for two seasons, although he's making threes like I've never seen, but he has been a player that we now can see, oh, wait, if you get Ben Simmons out of his way and you just run it through him, Curry's going to be able to make all sorts of jumpers, and then you can just build that team from a couple of years ago with Saric and Ilyasova, where you just surround him with shooters, Redick, and you're going to be good. But Ben Simmons and Embiid were a one seed. Yes. They were a one seed. Ben Simmons and Embiid. Now, they're not going to be a one seed. They're going to be a, with Embiid dominating. With Shaq saying, yep, best player in the game, and all Shaq says is Embiid is get down there and dominate. You're never enough. Now he's saying baddest man in the league. But it's so tight in the in the East, and they could be at one seed. They, They're only they, two and they, a half they, games they, back they right now. They could be, but they are not. They, they are only two and a half back. Right. But I believe, and you tell me if you think I'm wrong on this, okay. that their record will reflect the loss of Ben Simmons as Embiid climbs to MVP status, their record will reflect that they'll be five or six or eight games worse than they were last year, even if they're a two seed or a three seed. Yeah, that's fair. Totally. I and, agree with I, that. But and, they might get something for Ben Simmons before the season's up. We'll see. Oh, but I just always find that one interesting on because I believe you've heard me. You guys made fun of me because I was talking about Embiid as just a physical specimen. It's not even understanding how someone that size can play that way. Right. How like, someone that size can have that touch. And, but touch and also range, though, Mike. Touch, because range, skill. Like, but, but when it Lateral movement with his injury history, like he's not – He's not a liability out there. When it comes to a big man, physical body type, what I expect shooting threes, even from seven-footers, Dugats, doesn't physically look like that. It doesn't physically look like someone I know is going to overpower you in the post because he's just too big and strong for you. I know there are now seven-footers all over the place. Durant can shoot threes like, yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's someone that size exists. Crazy. Yeah. Who could, it's just an evolution of basketball that's nuts, nuts. But Embiid is also thick. Embiid is also, oh, I can, I can do that in the post on you as well. And when I think of Miami Heat games, I don't think of 17, 8-year-olds in the row behind me shouting, go Heat into my ears went on a bad night <laughs> I, I, i've never heard anyone ever say there's so many kids at these heat games it's the I least think. amount of kids i'd say yeah if you said to me what place down here draws the least amount of kids i would yeah. say no, it's a, i mean it was a wednesday it's a school night right like what we're, we're what are what, what are we doing here Given and how... also you throw a dog a bone mike hey there's a nightclub in the basement if you have to ask you can't afford it <laughs> <laughs> you did get me the tickets though <laughs> Hello? Papi. Sí. Estás confundido, ¿qué pasa? Espérate, espérate, que tengo a tu madre en la otra línea, ahora yo te llamo, ¿ok? Uh, no, espera, de, de, espera, yo la estoy, yo la voy a llamar a ella un momento, deja que mami, uh, deja que mami espere un momento, quería hablar contigo sobre lo que viste ayer por la noche. Espera un momento, sí, pero tengo, tengo a tu madre en el teléfono. All right, I'll, okay, you, I'll wait, I'll wait, just go over there and tell her you're okay. talking to me, I'll wait. He's going to hang up and then want to call me back, and he's going to end up calling me on my own phone. This is what's going to happen. Let's try that again. Let's just wait for a second. I just knew that I mean, was going to happen. Call it's, cell phone. It's, it's, yes, of course. He's going to call my cell phone. I mean, do you want me to just do it from my cell phone? You just want me to no, just do no, 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 no. We have a routine here.
or very well produced, as you can see. And this see. is part of the routine. He hangs up on you. And right. I'll tell. Yeah. Uh, so what's going to happen here is he's going to call me back on my phone. Hopefully everything's okay with my mother. Then you send him the voicemail, and I'll call him. No, I'm, I'm, what I'm going to have to do is just answer and tell him, Bobby, I'm going to call you one, in one second. And you know what's going to happen then? It's going to go to voicemail. Yeah. You got to wait like five seconds before you call him back. Well, we will do this in a second, but you just spent the day with your father yesterday. How alarming is it as as Chris Cody sees his father age, as I see in ways that are mortifying to me, but also adorable, my father's mortality and befuddlement making an appearance <laughs> every day. Your father's 80 years old. He's yes. swimming every day. Yep. He's running every day. Plays pickleball every day. Plays golf three times a week. But here's what annoys me about my dad as he gets older. Okay? He is so stubborn. He needs a hearing aid. He has a hearing aid. We purchased him like top-end hearing aid. Okay? And you can barely see it. No one can notice it. He never wears it. And so we are constantly having is it vanity? to repeat. Is it vanity? Is it he doesn't want to appear? Well, he'll say he'll make the joke that he doesn't want to hear me. Right? That's always the joke that'll make. Mike, can and you I'm like, how about your <laughs> I'm like, how about your granddaughters? Don't you want to hear them? He turns the television up to like 50 on the volume. And we're all sitting around. We can hear. But he is can't. it because he doesn't want to be old? Like your father, may I may I reveal? I think he's fighting it, yeah. May I reveal a secret about your father swimming? May I? Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Stugatz's father, 80 years old. Again, a virile man, uh, runs healthy. Swims nude every day. <laughs> Good for him. He does. Yeah, he's been doing it forever. I mean, I think that's what we call wet snitching, Dan. Well, he has permission. I mean, <laughs> it just makes him feel free. What's his reasoning for doing it, Stugatz? Uh, he feels free. He does. He feels free. So when we where we grew up, okay, we had a nice backyard, and the neighbors <laughs> really couldn't see. Not like if the neighbors were close, they could have seen anything anyway. I mean, he's my dad, okay? Forgive me, Stugatz. I burst out laughing at what you were saying because (laughs) Mike said in my ear, and I was mortified on his behalf, but also delighted comedically at the awkwardness of it. (laughs) I walked in on Cynthia's dad once doing that. (laughs) What? Yeah, just swimming naked in a pool. The father of the man. Like, hey, oh. The father-in-law doing right. was he doing the backstroke? <laughs> no, thank God, it was a backstroke. backstroke. No, well, my dad backstroke has done the backstroke. Bad. Elementary. No, but yeah. I saw, I saw, you know, saw bare ass, and then I just checked that one off. I've basically seen the entire family naked at that point, anyways. I only got like one left. So that is what a free sub. That's way worse than seeing your own dad. I mean, way worse. Yeah, yeah, it was super great. awkward. Yeah, oh yeah, it wasn't great. Got to be a heated pool, right? Yeah. I didn't see the the front, just the back. Mike, can we do something? I've never spoken to Stugatz's dad on the air. Do we want to call him while we wait for my dad uh, to how call? How about I call your dad first? Yeah, let's get your well, dad. Well, he's still on the call- phone with my mom. If he hasn't called me, it's not that he's forgotten. This is my father. This is my father you and my mother. Both dads? My dad is still waiting for the <laughs> think, South Beach session you're going to do with I him. Think, yeah. Do me a favor. Okay, let's do I don't this. think he wants to talk Let- to you. He's upset. <laughs> <laughs> we will talk to Stugatz's dad in a second. Call him live on the air. Add him to the mix. But uh, we will call my father As soon as he is okay with my mother, again, they will have this conversation 50 times today, and my father will keep it, and God bless him. My my father and my mother still holding on to each other dearly here, and uh, that's right. Yes. And and so when his son calls and needs something, his son is going to have to wait. As you should. And and he may may forget to call me altogether. (laughs) (laughs) But wrangling an old person. I remember when I started Highly Questionable Stugatz, I think I told you this, Brian Dawkins, such a badass. I was just asking him what he needed to be better at, like as what he felt needed improvement. And he's like, man, I really have to be patient with my old man because he is stubborn. Like, and, And we were talking about an old man who's getting up and on horses and doing stuff like he shouldn't be doing as you try to get these people to stop driving or maybe use a hearing aid. But what's the point of coming over if you can't have a discussion or a conversation and you can't hear anyone in the house? You're just sitting there. You're like a piece of furniture. I That's know. what I tell well, him. Well, but you say this, Dugats, and I ask you, right? I My, feel terrible. Sorry, this, Dad. I love you. You say it, he doesn't hear it's you. It's been a tough year. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't hear you when you say it. Um, <laughs> I've been trying to get my dad to stop driving, but you can't take it away from him. And I think it's dangerous. Like, it is I th- dangerous. I think it's yeah. dangerous for him to st- 
to, to be driving because I've been in the car with him and they don't want to admit that they've slowed down. Right. They And so the hearing aid or whatever it is, um, he, he will not listen to me. And and there I, I've never been able to reverse the process of they're always going to be dad. No matter how old you are and no matter how old they are, they're not going to think of you as the adult in the relationship as you're caring for them at the end. But the driving is such a good point because I have my concerns as well. Although my dad is sharp, but I've gotten worse at driving. And I'm not even 50 yet. Like I, Dan, I don't shoot the gap quite the way I used to shoot the gap. Wait, I mean, what? I just don't. Man. You're losing is it, it <laughs> early. <laughs> put, it, uh, put it on the poll, please. Please, Chris. No, but what he's saying is no, no, no. What he's saying though, this is not losing it early. This is Stugat's aggressive driver. When he said shoot the gap, you know what he's saying there. I know exactly. Just, what I he's mean, talking that's about. unnecessary to be driving like that. At, at, at his age, you got to shoot a gap sometimes. Oh, yeah. it feels great when you nail it. Oh, it's the best. It's also really scary when you cut it a little close. <laughs> The best one is across, and I've seen Dad do this, and you can imagine why it's no good. Cutting across five lanes because you got to get to the exit. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> or the express lane. <laughs> and <laughs> and this is what I'm saying is scary to me. And let's call my father again. <laughs> Hello, Bobby. Dime. Todo bien. Todo bien, todo bien. Yeah, I was worried about your mother because she went to uh, to the beauty uh, parlor to have her hair done, and uh, I didn't know that she needed something. That was the reason I couldn't talk to you. But that's fine. No problem. What do you need? Tonight is the night? What's that? Mom went to the beauty parlor. Yeah, she did go. She did go to have her hair done. But tonight is the night? Oh, it's always the night tonight. Whoa. <laughs> Last night was the night, Poppy. Last oh, yeah. night was the night with the Knicks. Did you enjoy that? Did you enjoy dragging the butcher, Poppy? Oh, the butcher. He ran out of trick plays. He didn't know what to do. Oh, the Heat, boy, I tell you one thing. They kick his ass from the get-go. He didn't know what to do. You know what I mean? But he looked good. He lost a lot of weight. <laughs> he did. The pressure is getting to him. <laughs> yes, Thibodeau has lost a lot of weight. Who played well last night? Who'd you like out there? Well, you know, my guy, Gabe, uh, Gabe Vinson. That's my guy. That's the guy that I got my money on, you know? So what can I tell you? What is that? Why is he your favorite? Why is, why is he my favorite? Because he's the underdog. He got, he gives you 15 to 20 points every game, almost every game. That's How not true at all. He had last that's, that's not true at all, that's though, Papi. What, what about P.J. Tucker? What about some of these other guys? Yeah, okay, that's true. I mean, but but they are, these, the other guys, they got a big name. You know, I mean, even uh, Tyler Hero has a big name, and uh, Duncan Robinson, has a, he had a good night last night. Uh, I think that Jimmy also had a good night last night, but this guy Gabe Vincent, you know, that's the guy that is going to to be the uh, the superstar with the Heat. You 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 mark my work for it. That's ridiculous, Bobby. He's not going to be a superstar for the Heat. Come on. No. What happened to seventy seven? How come he's riding the bench anyhow? What's his Again? name? Try and say his name, Bobby. Try and say his name. I I, I call him uh, Drew Seven. Drew Seven. What, I that, call him 77. Okay, because his last name has a 7 in it. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> Yurtsevin, uh, mom's mad, right, that he's not playing? Oh, yeah. She's mad because she says that she's better than uh, than uh, the other guy. What's his name? Wayne, uh, whatever his name is. I forgot. What is uh, his name? Let, I, I can remember his name. What's his name? Uh, Wumson. Wumson. Yes, the Wayne Wumson. Uh, Dwayne. <laughs> Deadman, yeah, now you've got me lacking confidence in how to say his name. How? What's his name? Donso, Wonson, Wonson, something like that, Wonson, you know. But I tell you one thing, my guy 77, I call him 77, you know, 007, I should call him, really. Oh, Papa, you love 007. Oh, Papa, yeah. that was, those were the days when Roger Moore was the saint. Oh, yeah, that, that's it. That's it. But the Saints, that was a long time ago. That was about 60 years ago. They don't play those, uh, those, those uh, I guess, videos anymore, whatever you call it, episodes anymore. So, What's your favorite, What is your favorite James Bond uh, character and movie? I don't think I've asked you this before. What? The James 007? What is my favorite? Well, it's 007. That's it. That's my guy, Sean Connery. Sean That's my favorite character. Mom. But, yeah. but do you remember any of the movies by the name? Like one of your favorites? 
well, Goldfinger, the, For Your Eyes Only, uh, uh, what's the guy, well, I forget, Pussy Galore. I mean, heaven, Papi, that? That Papi, Goldfinger. Papi, Papi, yeah. cuidado. Yeah. ¿Qué estás diciendo ahí? Oh, yeah. No, that's the, uh, that's the, uh, that's the name of the character on what, Goldfinger. What is, what, know. what's her name? Well, I, I can, I can say it again. It was a slip of my tongue, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bobby, tonight's the night, buddy. Tonight's the night, you know, you know me, I'm a professional bluffer. <laughs> Pussy galore. See you later, Bobby. <laughs> okay, bye. Tonight's bye. <laughs> Holy shit. Mom's coming from the beauty parlor, Bobby. Go get it. Raw dog again. <laughs> raw, rampant, raw doggery. Gave Vincent at eight points. I know, right? <laughs> Let's call Stugatz's dad. I want to just ask him about swimming nude. It must feel liberating, right? I've never done it. I'm assuming. You oh, have his number, yes. Don't you? Yes, I have done it. I have done it. And yes, the, the skinny dipping or. Just jumping in your own pool with the freedom of not having a care or a cloth in the world. Yes, uh, it. I'm I'm surprised though at 80 that Stugatz's dad is swimming nude, and I admire it. Like Chris, put it on the poll at Levitard Show. Is Stugatz's 80 year old dad to be admired for swimming nude? Because I believe that everyone should have that freedom at 80 years old. God bless. I think that he should be allowed to do it in public pools. Well, once, you've, once you've reached 80. Please. Where's that guy at the Cleveland? Don't give him any ideas. Once, okay? Just once you've reached 80. Because he does not give a bleep about anything maybe at this 90. point. Maybe 90. Maybe 90 is where I should put it. Should put it on the poll as well, Chris. Should America allow 90-year-olds to swim nude in public pools? Stop that. Hey, 95? Hey, should, hey, maybe 100. The Clevelander. Hi, this is Bob Wiener. I am not able to answer the phone right now. <laughs> leave it, leave it. Please leave a message when you hear the beat tone, and I will call you back as soon as possible. Thank you. <laughs> At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, <laughs> you may hang up or press 1 for more options. Hey, Pops, it's me. Do me a favor. Call back Mike Ryan or call back the uh, station. We're live on air right now, and Dan wants to talk to you about swimming nude. So uh, if you wouldn't mind, if you have a few minutes in between pickleball games, uh, give us a call back and we'll talk to you then. All right. Love you. Happy 27th birthday. That is young. 27 to Malika Andrews. And happy birthday to him. I don't care. Good luck. Did we not get the correct sound? Did we not... Were we not able to get the sound in the wrestling match with the lawyers that, that we is, needed? Uh, that is my bad. These generally have a theme, so hang on. Happy 27 is very young, Dan, I should just add. Some say it's the youngest age. What? It's not 27 is very young. How is it very the youngest age, though? For being so young. She is. She's great at what she yeah. does. But how is it the youngest age? It's very young, Stugatz. Oh, I know. I apologize, Malika. Here's your proper respect. And happy birthday to her. I don't care. Good luck. There has been an interesting shift at ESPN with Malika Andrews, Rachel Andrews, or Rachel Nichols, excuse me. Good save. Rachel Nichols pretty quietly sort of extracted from that whole situation. A woman who came up through South Florida and... I don't know how quiet it was, Dan. Oh, quiet leaving at the end here. Leaving I'm at talking, the end, yeah, I'm, they just let her contract lapse. I'm saying the end of it was quiet. The last 12 months and now they buy her out of the contract and that's it. The woman who represented for the league, she was... A bridge through the LeBron years and everything else. She was a bridge between ESPN and the league in a league partnership. You can make the argument her, Beatle, most powerful, uh, uh, Doris Burke, most powerful women bringing you sports 
building the bridge in the partnership. Rachel Nichols built something at ESPN, a show that Adam Silver demanded. He wants something like Inside the NBA over there. He wants it at ESPN. They've been working forever to try and figure out how to do that. But The Jump was a daily basketball show that was basically paid programming for the league. Here's a half hour in the middle of your day, a basketball program. Yes, league, we will not only pay you billions of dollars to run your games, we will have an infomercial for your sport here led mm -hmm. by Rachel Nichols as a bridge. It's a decade, right? A decade. She went from the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel, yes. Washington Post, became one of the most powerful women in sports. ESPN left ESPN, came back to ESPN because she did uh, CNN. Well, Turner, uh, she did TNT and CNN. In fairness to her and the people that put that show together, they did a good job with it. Like they have, they did oh, a very good well, job. Wait with a minute, it. when yeah. I say infomercial, I please forgive me. That may sound like criticism. I'm just saying it's paid programming for the league, no and doubt. it was good. Yeah. There's, a, yeah. it was a good show. And if you like basketball, you had to be watching that show because they really knew their basketball and they were teaching you about basketball. And actually, I'd argue, I mean, it's smarter than than what Kendrick Perkins is doing now, which is just argument television or when he goes you saw what he said yesterday though right uh you said what kendrick perkins said all the smoke podcast where he's saying i haven't told anybody this but harden wants to play with Embiid, and i thought it was funny to myself you know espn might have wanted you to say that there <laughs> but he's reporting on the all the smoke podcast that harden wants to be with Embiid. dry snitching but Rachel Nichols, when I say she's leaving there quietly, uh, the ending, you're right, Mike. The ending was explosive and loud, and the New York Times reported something, and a, a race thing resulted. And it's been interesting to watch Maria Taylor, uh, very good at ESPN, very good at ESPN, but a little harder what she's doing now, and it's harder to navigate. And on NBC, it didn't feel quite to me. Like, oh, this is this is the woman who's had command over the room and is confident. Like at ESPN, she was that, but now she's doing something. Well, now that... she's actually in a room. She wasn't really a studio right. talent. She was on the field. But I thought it was interesting to watch sort of, oh, okay, there's she's raw, good, strong voice, like strong personality. But, oh, the hosting stuff requires a gift I don't have. I sweat too much. I get nervous. I don't have the grace of television to just weave in and out. And direct the broadcast. And now Malika Andrews is doing that at 27 years old. Like, she's doing it and deserves it. She's good at it. She looks very comfortable doing what she's doing. I haven't actually watched her doing the studio hosting thing. It's a hard thing because Maria made the jump from on-field reporter yeah. to studio. No pun intended. And Malika did the same thing at a, at a very young age. She's super, super impressive. I saw her sister got hired by ESPN, too. A little unfair that you put it all on, on Kendrick because Malika's a part of that studio show, too. Um, that you called argument television. I haven't watched it, so I don't know. Uh, but uh, I, I really did watch the jump a lot, though, and I, I enjoyed that show. I don't. I was talking about what Kendrick Perkins is doing all over ESPN. I'm not talking about as yeah. part. of I mean, He was always doing that, even like on the jump. Okay, but now he's the lead Deal. voice. But when, <laughs> funny enough, when Rachel Nichols was at the height of her controversy, and you can imagine the meetings, right? What are the first words on this that we're going to say on the jump? the paid infomercial at the intersection where Silver was out there saying he was defending Nichols. That ain't an easy thing. He was doing that because of the relationship, because he knows the work she's done for him over 10 years, running that show as a program for the league, Stugatz, because the thing gets lost there, right? These are partnerships. ESPN and the NBA enter into a partnership. You get a certain amount of programming and also, hey, watch this commercial we put here daily that is going to be an arm for the sport. And it doesn't mean it's not it, – I'm not saying it's propaganda, Stugatz. I'm saying the access they got, everything else, it was very much a partnership. And now Kendrick Perkins is the first voice that you hear speak when Rachel had to come and apologize. That was the first voice on behalf of the network. They had to put a black person in front of a camera and say, you want to talk about this? Rachel Nichols is in the middle of a race thing, and it's going to be hard for us to get a woman who's black to sit here. So – Who's going to be the first voice? Kendrick and uh, Richard Jefferson were on the uh, on And the it was set. such a hard spot for them, yeah, for yeah, Kendrick, and and such a tough spot. It wasn't navigated well. I I think they're closing the door on that. Hard to navigate. Yeah, super. And they, I 
mean, we're armchair quarterbacking a little bit, but they didn't handle it the the, the best. That's of ways. not my point. My point is that Kendrick was the first voice. It's my, my point is when you talk about what the coverage of that league becomes, if you're going to put Stephen A. on every show and you're going to put Mike Greenberg on the show, you're going to have Magic Johnson and Mike Wilbon. This is going to be the partnership of how ESPN delivers the comp to inside the NBA and what they've done with the NBA with their entertainment vehicle. Kendrick Perkins rose high and fast because he does a specific thing that is more of what they're doing. I saw their countdown show yesterday because he were on ESPN and it was, you know that that that, that show has always tr- kind of struggled to recap. It, they've always tried like a bunch of different. I mean, TNT set the standard so high. I like that Michael it's hard, Eves. I'm right? glad Michael Eves is getting no, he's a very shot good at, yeah. at studio hosting, mm-hmm. and maybe it's just got to find them time. But I was like, this is not better than what I saw previously. So look. Where do I go if I want NBA coverage then? It kind of feels relaxed and a little dangerous and a good comp to inside the NBA. Where you're, Mike, you're, I feel you're like you might talk. have a place. I might feel you're like you're all talk. What are you well, doing? You know what? Okay. Thank you for asking, Mike. <laughs> because the Lakers and the Sixers play tonight. And if you want relaxed, sort of smoky marijuana feel yeah. to your Seven post game. With a hint of booze. Coverage. YouTube <laughs> slash Levitard and friends. Not only for free tonight will you get possibly boozy Amin El Hassan, NBA correspondent, looking for the lane as a parody character outside of ESPN of I'll be America's drunk basketball correspondent. <laughs> I don't think anyone no has. No one's doing it. I don't I mean, think anyone has no this lane. Well, so done maybe, it on purpose. No one else has done that. And I will bring my trusty sidekick, Tom Haberstroh, Haberstro, to the proceedings. He will be bald and he will play a guitar. And it'll be strange, and merriment will ensue. YouTube slash <laughs> Levitard and friends tonight after Lakers Sixers. And also, if you subscribe to that channel, I should tell you this because we're excited about this for Sunday. You're going to watch the game with us. We're going to do a watch party. It's a we're going to do a show basically during the final football game before the Super Bowl. We don't think a lot of shows out there can do what we're going to do Sunday night, which is try to do a show around that football game while not having the rights to that football game. Yeah, I can't pot up the sound on the board. That one's going to be true. Give Metal Dangerous Arc game. time. <laughs> Give Metal Arc time. Yeah, we're going to compete with Amazon yes. for the NFL rights. <laughs> with Greg Cody <laughs> cooking shit for us. Yeah. He's already annoying me with that. He's really putting effort. Oh. No, in a good way that you'll actually appreciate. He's like, he's putting effort he's in? getting serious about I'm this. He's like, him. I might need you to come over on Saturday and help me do well, prep. This and was so him. funny. I, w- I wish. this is. Did you hear, Chris, the conversation that I had with your father about this because I'm like, uh, Greg, we're doing this thing on Sunday, and there's a good chance he'll be on pills and Bud Lights and won't know where he is and be confused by, wait, you guys are doing a show Sunday night? I don't understand. That's what happened last time. We don't know what Greg Cody we're going to get. He was totally disoriented coming in here at night, and Chris Cody has told you, 10 p.m., my dad, the Bud Lights, we're going to need to get him a driver home. There's no telling what happens with Greg Cody, but he's sitting in this chair on Tuesday, and I say to him, we're doing this thing Sunday. You said you made the most amazing pea soup of your life this week. Would you like to come in and have this party with us and enjoy it? And he's like, man, I don't want to work. I don't want to I don't want to work on cooking all week and stuff. And I'm like, okay, but it'd just be good for your podcast because a lot of people are going to be watching because oh, we're What'd doing something. No, oh, that's no. what happened. He's like, I have three meals for you on Sunday. That's what happened. Wait, you'd get publicity for my podcast? And he's like, oh, I got some ribs I can cook up. Any, pretty any sure- allergies or uh, or <laughs> restrictions? What he, was, yeah. what he was saying was he normally records the podcast on Sunday nights, and then we informed him his producer, his son, is going to be here. But no, that didn't sell him, though. <laughs> that, all he was thinking he about. Want to come, that's but why. He didn't want to come. He doesn't want to come. And you might get that. I don't know what else we'll have for you on Sunday. YouTube slash Lebitard and friends subscribe so you don't forget. Subscribe to tonight's post game show with Tom Amin and assorted guests. Like- They're getting better and better with doing that stuff, and Tom is really finding his voice. And as you mentioned, you might find him strumming a guitar. I'm still singing "Sweet Lance." So rich. This was supposed to be Kyrie's night, but you said, no, I'm not going down. No, I'm not going down out of fight, sweet Lance. You scored 20 in the first quarter, 
the Nets defense just said we are out of order, sweet Lance. <laughs> you played that air guitar. We missed you so much, but you weren't very far from our hearts, from our souls. Where were you the last two years? No one fucking knows, sweet Lance. <laughs> more sweet of that, Lance. more of that. Lance Stevenson did not know that. The, who else is doing it that way? Who else has Tom Haberstroh serenading Lance Stevenson for a 20 point first quarter? That's Nobody. Catchy. Sweet Lance. <laughs> it was. Hey, dude, look at Jessica. Jessica's a pretty Lance. It is. It gets up in your soul. YouTube slash Levitard and friends, you subscribe, and this is what happens. You'll get that tonight. And on Sunday, we got an assortment of prizes, including a totally befuddled Greg Cody, not knowing where he is, and into the Miller Lights. Adnan, you have the same sculpting weirdness, right? Uh, I wouldn't say I have the same level of sculpting weirdness, but you are right, Dan. There's a real paranoia, a real frustration, a real self-loathing every time there's a slight hiccup. When guys like being witty are known for being smooth and we're less than stellar, it pains us. He's going to have a sleepless <laughs> night tonight, but I'm with witty. There was a small hiccup. He fought through. <laughs> sleepless night. I think worse than the hiccup is how much everyone enjoys the hiccup. And the fact <laughs> I can feel the heat. Like, there's this heat yeah, that, we're all that staring washes at you. over yes. me. It's like, Rooting oh, no, you they yard it. <laughs> so much easier being me. <laughs> Anytime someone reads any sort of copy, I just start sitting at the edge of my seat. Like, <laughs> it's a roller coaster. It's his brain. <laughs> Who enjoys it most when Witty is imperfect? Chris Cody. Chris Cody. I think it, Jessica, yeah. I think it might be you. Like you. Mm. No, 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 it's Chris. It's, it's Chris, Chris Cody. It's Chris yeah. Cody. I'm, I'm, a, I'm 1B, though. He's 1A, I'm 1B. It's the worst reader of us all that enjoys that the most. <laughs> Anyone in the room here... Anyone, Stugatz is, is Stugatz. Who's the worst reader? Put it on the poll, Guillermo. Chris, it's a push. Chris Cody <laughs> or Stugatz. You want to take a guess on by percentage who the leading by percentage three point shooter in the NBA is? Steph Curry. Desmond Bain. Man, I'm stuck. Got no idea. I imagine it's going to be a random name. I, I think Steph has too much volume to be like the highest shooting three point. I'm surprised you don't know my percentage. Mike. Yeah, I don't know everything, contrary to what people project me to be when it comes to basketball. Duncan Robinson. No, hell no. <laughs> you don't, you, you're trying to trigger me. God, you're messing with me. <laughs> Same team. Is it Max Struess? Nope. What? Huh? It can't be P.J. Tucker. Could it it's not P.J. Tucker? Tucker. It is P.J. Tucker. Oh, my wow. God. Oh, my God. The, the dude. Wow. Hold on. The Enforcer. dude that went like 0 for 17 once? From the corner. Wow. That's his shot. And he's been doing it. for. He stayed in the league for three years. Defense and that. Just from the corner. The best shot in the NBA. I know he's been a good player. But having him on your team, I have like such a newfound appreciation for what P.J. Tucker does. I watch the Heat regularly. And that is that is a stunner to me. I think it's 47 or 48%. Yeah, 45.9%. That is insane. What a signing. Adnan Verk with us now. We are not here to talk P.J. Tucker with him, but I do <laughs> want to bring up a previous conversation that really got people inflamed around here. Adnan, thank you for joining us, and I need to know from you the proper way to eat a steak. Well, it's always going to be with you guys. I think the key is, and Aaron Boone wants to know this about me, speaking of odd observations, he says that I choke up on my fork. And I said, I don't understand what you mean. He goes, well, the way to hold the fork is to hold at the tip because you're you're choking up on that thing right away. So you you clearly don't trust your hand skills in a fork. So specific <laughs> to a steak, I'm choking up early. I've got two strikes. I'm just trying to make contact against Randy Johnson. I feel like I'm John Crook right now. So I am digging in. And I think the proper way, Dan, is to have – you know, fairly sizable portions, something that is malleable, but I try to go big or go home because of the fact I don't trust my skills. I'm trying to just get in there. And like I said, I'm choking up and trying to fight through. I asked the question poorly. It is my fault. 
How do you have it prepared? How do you oh, have the? You. Uh, but I, uh, no, no I, but thank I, you for that answer. I, I am fantastic. delighted that you had an answer anyway, and that you choke up on your fork is not that you had any kind of answer, Dan. You chew right. on it. That's how you eat a steak. Right. I, I yeah. appreciate the effort there. He really just tries to get <laughs> yeah, in there. Right? He's, he's an aggressive steak eater, and I feel like he might have been faking it there as a professional yeah. broadcaster. You got to sell the. I don't understand yeah. the question entirely, sure, but yes, I'm going to yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, get yeah. an answer. I'm an avid listener yeah. of the show, yeah. Dan. I, I love that conversation. <laughs> It never actually happened. No, no, I was just saying. It was great. I loved it. I, I like to go with my steak medium, although it makes me think of the great late John Saunders, who would always have his steak well done. And Jesse Palmer once tried to explain to him, like, you, you shouldn't do that. And he's like, what do you mean? He goes, it ruins all the juices. Like, it's completely defeating, to quote Raging Bull, it defeats its own purpose. Like, what are you doing with the steak? And Saunders would get apoplectic. and said, no, nope, that's how I like my steak. I do it. And one time I said to John, I go, my mom makes a well done steak. And I love my mom, and she's a great cook, but she doesn't know how to make a but good steak. But your mom's steak. wrong, well, yeah. Yeah, right, Jessica, exactly. I love my mom. I was never a big steak fan because we just it was so just charred to a crisp. Once I started going to actual steak houses, <laughs> medium is the way to go. And if you go to a restaurant that you don't trust, you should get a temperature that's below what you would normally get because they tend to overcook the steak. Most people cook it defeats its own purpose. Most people go which way here? If we put it on a poll on the way to do this, whether it's well done, uh, mildly well done, medium, is medium, medium, medium. Bl bloody, yeah, medium. bloody, yeah. medium, medium Rare. or medium well. I get a little yeah. charred, a little dark on the outside, pink on the inside. Sliced porterhouse. It's absolutely delicious. The yeah. best. Medium rare. And if rare. the if the middle is wow. cold, I don't mind it. Put that on the poll. Worst way to eat a steak, uh, Billy. Put that on the poll. Well done, charred, or the middle a little cold? Because I think both extremes are going to have people be like, whoa, that's a little much. But if I'm going to a place that I don't trust, I'll be like on the most medium side of medium rare you can do. But no, once I was once I was called out by a... Uh, by some people that know what they're talking about. I, I stopped doing like medium, medium rare now. Billy, why are you laughing from behind the mask again with something that's great off air but not helpful on air? Well, no, this, this time the bad teammate is witty because I told him what? you should say I like the taste of blood because he's known as a murderer. And he said I'm not doing Forgive that. Forgive me for, what, not, for, for not wanting to lean into being a murderer. <laughs> Christ. And then we will talk to you about what is going on this week with Cinephile in a bit. But we were talking before you came on about the Hall of Fame, the Baseball Hall of Fame, and how outrage is the real new national pastime. And we were laughing about the idea that it's not hard to understand how it is that Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens didn't make the Hall of Fame However, it is weird that there would be outrage now when basically that they're not in the Hall of Fame. The reason they're not on the Hall of Fame is because of the outrage for what they did. And now, like, it's just a strange thing to witness over the last 10 Where years. Where have you been? Like, over the last 10 years. They're not in the Hall of Fame because everyone was pissed at them, and now everyone's pissed that they're not in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I completely agree, Dan. I love the way that this flipped. Originally, it was these guys can't be in the Hall of Fame. They violated the integrity of the sport, the character of the sport, which, by the way, is part of the criteria for voting someone into the Hall of Fame. And everyone seemed to be okay with it. And now people are outraged. The Baseball Writers Association of America, you hypocrites, how dare you not let Bonds and Clemens in? Okay, they cheated, but there's other cheaters in. Yvonne Rodriguez, uh, Mike Piazza is accused of it, Jeff Bagwell, et cetera. This is ridiculous, and, and I get it. I, I completely understand. If I went to Cooperstown and I don't see plaques honoring Roger Clemens and Barry Bonds, it feels incomplete to me. I totally understand why someone would say that. To my mind's eye, they're the greatest hitter and pitcher I've seen in my lifetime, in 35 years as a baseball fan. But I'm with you. I, I'm shocked at how everyone is raising pitchforks and torches and wants to storm Cooperstown when, to be clear, Major League Baseball doesn't have a vote. This is the Baseball Writers Association of America. This is how they judged it, and this is how they've been judged. This is not a surprise. These guys didn't get in. The numbers have been inching up, but nobody thought they'd get in. But for some reason, people are very upset. But don't you think the voting process is flawed when you see one voter sitting in a ballot with one vote, and that one vote is Jeff Kent? <laughs> <laughs> no truth to the rumor it was our boy Mad Dog Russo, who Stu Gatz and I both love and who loves <laughs> Jeff Kent, loves the Giants. I, I hear you, Roy. What what's interesting to me is like, and this is what I do find fascinating is that everyone has different criteria. So for example, John Morosi, he voted for all the steroid guys, so to speak, with the exception of Alex Rodriguez and Manny Ramirez. 
And I said, oh, they're using like extra steroids? He said, no, they actually got suspended for their PED use. The other guys didn't. And I said, so you believe Bonds and Clemens used? Clearly, he said, yes. But they were not punished by Major League Baseball, so on and so forth. But, but to your point, Roy, there have been stories of guys. I, I can't remember what it is now, but I talked to a writer once who had B.J. Surhoff on his Hall of Fame ballot. Hmm. And I said, I I'm all for the Brew Crew, but like, what is that about? And he said, oh, I, I grew up in the same small town as B.J. Surhoff, and I promised him if ever I had a vote, I'd vote for him for the Hall of Fame. And I said, like, what are we doing? <laughs> like, that kind of stuff is ridiculous. And that happens more often than not. And Dan knows this. A lot of these writers, like anybody, hold grudges. Everybody feels slighted by people. David Ortiz, if you go by this criteria, he failed the test in 2003, an anonymous test. I got it. So-called false positive. Sure. The guy was an average player of the Twins. He was released and then becomes one of the greatest hitters of all time. Okay, maybe it wasn't a coincidence. Fine. There are other players who have improved over time. But he gets it on the first ballot and everyone looks the other way, whereas Clemens and Bonds are punished so severely. So I'll go with this logic. Ramirez and A-Rod apparently were using the whole time and used when they knew penalties were in place. They can't get in. Got it. Bonds and Clemens, Hall of Fame worthy players prior to their alleged drug use. So you would say three time MVP, three time sign. They should still get in once you can wipe away the character and integrity of the game. Okay. But Ortiz was an average player, then allegedly started using and became Ted Williams. So I, I, I don't understand <laughs> that process where Poppy gets in first ballot. I'm like, but wait, don't we kind of all know what's going on here? But He's a beloved guy. Stu, they love him. Ortiz is a great guy. He's, well, we asked that question areas. earlier. If Bond smiled just once, do you think he'd be in the Hall of Fame? <laughs> yes, I absolutely <laughs> think so. If Barry Bonds did a Barry Bonds rehab tour and all of a sudden became like a juggler and he started doing stand-up. We're like, oh my God, I love the way Barry Bonds has shown this different side of himself. Have you seen Barry Bonds stand-up? It's as good as Eddie Murphy Raw. And he also juggles. Like, it's insane. <laughs> Like a contortionist, like Barry Bonds, likable Barry Bonds is back. We gotta get that guy in the Hall of Fame. He'll entertain kids, Cooper still weekend. He'll juggle. This would be incredible. That would absolutely happen. You are a nice man. You do not say uh, mean things about anything other than movies that have offended you because they're not as good as you want them to be. Are you, as a professional broadcaster and someone who cares about baseball and has been paying attention for the last 20 years, are you confused by just A-Rod getting all the broadcasting jobs after we <laughs> chased him out of the sport with one of the great suspensions, longest suspensions of all time? Like, we're just like, never mind. We'll just, we'll allow him back in, but not anyone else with this resume. I, I find it utterly baffling, Dan. And you're right. I'm not one for whom animus comes naturally. I've met Alex Rodriguez once. We were at a seminar there for Major League Baseball. I have two observations. One, he had giant hands. When he shook my hand, I was enveloped. The other is when he writes notes, most of us, I believe, write from left to right. Alex Rodriguez writes notes. Like he, he used maybe eight pages, eight words per page. Like it was incredible how wasteful he was with the paper. He was writing sideways and then flipping the page. Like, All right, this guy really gets the most of or the least I should say of his notebook. That's all I can tell you about my personal acquaintance with Alex Rodriguez. Interviewed him in Iowa in Dubuque for the Field of Dreams game. Again, very nice guy, charismatic. I got it. But to your point, 162 game suspension. That, that's about as severe as it gets. Like you're gone for the whole year. You you violated the rules involving PEDs and you lied about it. But guess what? We got you an ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. We're doing a Manning type mega cast. Your Fox, this guy. I don't know whether applaud or cry. I guess I'll applaud and say I wish others can get as many second chances the way that Alex has taken advantage of them. But Billy is pointing out, what are we doing? Like, what are we doing with our outrage? Is the outrage real? Because it doesn't seem like it could in any way be real if this is how we're doing this. Yeah, I think that that's a good point by Billy. The, the, the outrage only seems to go so far. Part of it is because for specifically for A-Rod, right? He gets criticized by baseball fans on social media. So I believe those who are in favor of Alex say, well, social media is only one barometer. For example, I love the show. I don't go and tweet every day. What a great point by Billy. Or love the fact that Woody supports Cinephile. I just listen to your show. That's how I support it. Similarly, if somebody likes Alex Rodriguez, they're not inclined to tweet, hey, what a great job A-Rod's doing of analysis of this game with Matt Baskersian. Twitter is generally a place for people venting and angry. So I think the executives look at the outrage and go, well, that's just a small portion of people. We think Alex is a good guy. He's a big name, big talent. We're going to stick with him. I believe that's their thought process. And I do think, in fairness to him, he's better in studio than he is on games. I, I don't think on games that's his strength. Don't you wasted all the people complaining yesterday about the Hall of Fame watch baseball? 
Like if that number of people who was that upset about Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens not getting in, like watched games, baseball would be yeah. totally different. I couldn't agree more, Billy. I used to always say this with Rosillo. People would complain about the length of playoff games. I said, you know, those are the people not watching. Because you and I who are watching and sleep deprived, like we're tired the next day and we're annoyed, but we got through it. Like 1248, final pitch, but hell of a game. Marlins win. The people are complaining, going, oh, God, how about these baseball games? They start at 835. They're not done until 1230. You were watching anyways. You're in bed at 1030. Like you, you were watching my 600 pound life or something. So like, don't, what do you care? Like I, I'll watch whatever I want to watch. If you don't want to watch it, that's fine. Like I, Whitty knows this with soccer. If you're passionate about it, you'll support it no matter what. And if you're not into it, that's totally fine. I, I've never been that guy who gets offended if someone doesn't like baseball. They go, oh, God, baseball sucks. It's so boring. I go, well, that's your opinion. I, I respectfully disagree. I love my things. You love your things. And I think you're right, Billy. The yeah. amount of people who are outraged saying baseball is hypocritical, the Hall of Fame's a joke, they wouldn't even know where Cooperstown is on a map. They don't know who's getting in. They don't even know who's on the ballot. They couldn't even care less. They just want to get angry and shake their fists about something. You should get angry and offended more. Like it's fun. As someone who, <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't do it, but it, it seems like fun. You should do it. Like this whole, like, oh, I'm gonna just turn the other cheek. Overrated. Right. <laughs> if there's something I was gonna be upset about, Billy, our boy Tim Kirchin is gonna be in the oh. Hall of Fame, which is incredible news and long overdue. And, and for anybody who's outraged about the Hall of Fame, can say, well. Did he get this one right? Kirchner is going in the Hall of Fame. And if he wasn't in, then yes, I'd be outraged no, today. I'm no, upset. No, but no, no. This but is, Jason Stark was definitely pushing for him. This is this is where you get upset about it. Should have happened sooner. Yeah. Should have happened sooner, Adnan. That's the take. I'm happy to see it, but mm -hmm. this is an outrage. It should have happened mm -hmm. 20 years ago. How dare you guys make this yeah. good, decent man wait 20 years for his moment in the sun? What if he would have died? Oh, not to take work. it to a dark place, but like not to take it to a dark place. Really, 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 it's, it's because it's that guy. Not it's not yeah. Fifty dollars. Fifty dollars. <laughs> wow. To that point, Dan, the most horrific thing I've ever heard. I, one of my jobs I worked at previously was not ESPN. Someone came up to you and whispered and goes, "Hey, I don't think you're the guy for this, but would you be interested in a death pool?" And I said, "I beg your pardon." He goes, "We have a death pool." And I go, and he could tell I was my abject horror on my face. I said, "I'm not sure what you're describing." He goes. We guessed like world leaders, political assassinations. Who's going to die next? I said, I said, God bless you. I'm not much of a pulley. I'm going to hold out this one. I think Billy is the ringleader of a death pool, though. Oh, is Billy, put it on the poll. Is Billy the ringleader of a death pool? I mean, when if we're going to go, we're going to get paid. Yeah. Be the yeah. Grim Reaper. Right, Billy? <laughs> Zigak. Um, put it on the poll as well. Is Turn the Other Cheek overrated at Levitard's <laughs> show? It is. I wanted to ask you uh, about something we were talking about earlier this week because you are someone, I believe, who the craft of play-by-play, -play, the craft of broadcasting, you are listening to games on radio and television differently than I am. When you think of craftsmen who are better than Adnan Verk at play-by-play, -play, somebody you're in awe of, uh, give me a handful of the people doing broadcasting now, young or old, where you're like, and different skill sets, television and radio, yeah. but where you're like, these people are unbelievable at how they uh, allow me, because Al Michaels is about to get a lot of money from somebody at 77 years old, because yeah. ESPN is interested in play-by-play, -play, and I don't think the average sports fan appreciates this stuff the way that you do. I don't think I appreciate this stuff the way that you do. Well, I couldn't agree more, Dan, and certainly you could appreciate great writing perhaps more than I could, and what you're talking about in terms of broadcasting, once you do it, you know how hard it is, you appreciate the challenges, how somebody can make it look so smooth and so easy. One quick thought on Al Michaels. He was on our friend Bob Costa's show back on the record on HBO, Bomani Jones, of course, on the show as well. In talking to Al Michaels, Bob discovered that Al will never eat swordfish because he was once out for dinner with John Madden. And Madden said, don't eat swordfish. It's got all sorts of boils and tumors. So there's your swordfish uh, warning of the day. Also, Al Michaels has never eaten a vegetable. How about this? Going back to your steak conversation, he says if he gets a steak and potatoes, potatoes are okay because they're starchy, and the vegetables are touching the steak, Al Michaels will send 
send back the steak. He does not want asparagus juice anywhere near his steak. And that is how this man is 77 years old and about to call a Super Bowl. A few names that stand out to me. Dan Shulman, I think, is incredible. He's got, obviously, a great voice, but he loves baseball. He feels it, which I know is a term which may induce some eye rolls, but I really think it's true. You listen to Dan Shulman on a baseball playoff game. It's sublime, as is our friend Boog. I mean, John Shami's is as good as it gets when he's calling a baseball game. I think Joe Buck is amazing. I think he gets a rough ride for a lot of reasons, which I don't really understand. Maybe nepotism, whatever. I think he's overcome that. Roy knows as a hockey guy how much I love Doc Emmerich. I miss listening to him call the Stanley Cup final. And Adam Amin, my dear friend. Of course, he worked together at ESPN. Adam is the voice of the Chicago Bulls. He does a great job on Fox. I think he's going to call Super Bowl one day. I think there's nothing he can't do. There's a handful for you. We'd agree, though, if there's going to be an Al Michaels Monday Night Football reunion, now would be the time to do it, right? I mean, yeah, Billy. he's just... No spring chicken. I'm just saying, uh, 77. God, $100. Jesus. He's not $100. eating vegetables, Dan. I mean, we don't know when it'll be available. Well, you Monday Night Football every pool. couple you of years. But... Do you have him in your death pool? You're the ringleader of a death I'm pool, as saying, we've just established. Like, if you want him back on there... Okay, you owe me $100 before you, you leave Oh, today. my God. Um... Adam, I'm sorry. Adnan, forgive me. I'm just rattled. He keeps killing people. I think I'm next. Not kill. I'm just saying what if, you know? We're all, we're all going to hey, die, guys. Billy, yes. Billy, be honest. How Maybe. excited were you when you heard that Bob Saget died? Okay? Be honest. Oh, my God. What about Betty White? Whoa. What? Cindy Poitier, okay? Oh, Billy hey, was like, hey. okay. Who? I'm oh, sorry, bro. Sorry, that's fair enough. Fair enough. I'm sorry, bro. Mike, Meatloaf died. <laughs> cinephile adnan what do you have this week you went Macbeth last week denzel washington i was unfair to you because i did not realize <laughs> apple plus is getting into the game like tom hanks has done two movies that are hidden on <laughs> apple plus he's done two of them big giant movies because apple plus badly wants into this game and they've got all the money in the world and so they get an unbelievable cast to do Macbeth. you did that on cinephile last week what are you doing on cinephile this week yeah, I know Shakespeare is not to everyone's taste, but the Apple Plus, the subtitles did come in handy because at times you go, I think I know what they're saying, but I don't really understand. The subtitle helps, but it's peak Denzel. It's up there with his work when it comes to defenses and the hurricane, Malcolm X and all the rest of it. This week, inspired by you and your show, rather than Spitting Chicklets, the great hockey podcast, we do Spitting Chickens. So that's right. Remember Eraserhead? <laughs> that's a really obscure movie. Dan will know it. David Lynch film. There's a scene where a guy orders a chicken. And the chicken's moving, even though it's already cooked, and then blood starts coming out. Yeah, okay, that's where he went. Also other chicken, Chicken Run, Chicken Little, Back to the Future famously. What are you, chicken? Marty McFly can't resist that. So that's a very in-depth part of Cinephile. Your show is now invaded Thank Cinephile, you. spitting chickens in honor of what you guys suggested. And I am also telling... I am telling the audience right now, you got to go find Cinephile to reward Adnan from coming down from the lofty perch of Macbeth to allow you your circus tent nonsense. He's compromising his principles. Adnan does yeah. not want anyone telling him which movies to review or how to do his show. He is the expert yeah. here, and yeah. we have given him the freedom to be that expert because he's excellent at it. But you are throwing our audience a bone this week. Yeah, I'm about as highfalutin and pompous as it gets when it comes to film criticism. So to actually denigrate myself to discussing chickens in film and incorporating Stu Gatz and Rocky too. You're right, Dan. That really is a big concession on my part. We also talked to the director of King Richard, Ronaldo Marcus Green. He's a fascinating guy, big sports guy. His, his dad actually wanted to be a baseball player. That's why he loved telling the story of the Williams sisters. So lots of good fun here on Cinephile. Look I was so it. disappointed by that movie. I get so disappointed by Hollywood, Crash, whatever. When they tackle race subjects, they do it so poorly poorly and they really went syrupy saccharine after school special i believe the 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 venus and serena story i believe is actually grittier and better than the way they portrayed it even though will smith was great trying to summon acting expertise there that really moved you with richard williams i just thought it was way too soft well you're alienating yeah. the white viewers as well they're trying to appeal to everybody in this situation because as you know republicans buy shoes too <laughs> Thanks to Michael Jordan for that. You're right, Roy. I asked Ronaldo that question, Dan, and he said to me, because I said specifically, how much involvement did the Williams sisters have, Venus and Serena? And he said a little bit, but it's more one of the other sisters. And he framed it as a positive. They could say, this is how the house looked. This is the kind of bed we had. This is the kind of clothes we had, which I said, I appreciate that. There's an eye to detail that the actual person can represent. But you guys are right. When you're trying to go broad sometimes, you kind of miss the mark. It's, it's why the devil's in the details. To make something truly universal, you make it specific, which is why I love Kenneth Branagh's Belfast so much. It's one of my favorite movies of the year. Thank you, sir. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate you.
All right, I need to address this with you, Stugatz, because behind the scenes, this is getting super annoying with Mike Ryan. He's enjoying trolling the audience. He's enjoying uh, just creating, uh, I, I mean, everyone listening to the sound of my voice would say, you make a bet, you pay the bet. Yes. Those are the rules. And, I mean, it's just as simple as that. Ooh. But And I know many of you are tired of this. I'm tired of it. It's making an appearance every day in these meetings and the conflict and the chemistry that we have in the room because Mike Ryan is totally out of control, and he keeps coming in here. I don't know if you heard what just happened there, but he's talking about Bad Bunny. He's recruiting Hollywood Dear entertainment. Friend. He's yeah. just he's mm -hmm. what he's doing. The biggest star on the planet, many are saying, Bad Bunny came to my support last night to stop the shave and – you know, it used to start as a joke, and yeah, maybe I'm inflating the amount of support that I have. No, this is totally flipped. And now I am demanding that Stu got shave his head because I won that bet oh, by a all lot. All right, I, I don't want to do this with you anymore. Boy, You're annoying the look audience. At me. Look, at, look at my eyes. Come on, Mike. Shave I'm your looking head. at them. Shave your head. You lost. Look at my eyes. Right. No. You, all right. I, I won this bet by a lot. You didn't know what you were talking about with college football. I was right the whole time. Yeah. Uh, SEC game. Throw that. Throw the results in Georgia out. I don't want to hear the argument anymore. I'm tired of, like... Uh, oh, there's no more argument. I The no, public Mike, is on my side. Mike, Johnny, Hashtag stop Just because Johnny Depp is on your side does not mean... that He's not a man of the people. John John, John Depp, to those who are close with him, right. may, at one point, was bad bunny levels of celebrity, and he totally came to my support, too. How are you going to... Sir Elton John? Mm-hmm. All right, Bad Mike, Bunny. Mike, I don't want to do John this anymore. Depp, All right, can we? Jason Statham. All right, the great <laughs> Dean Blandino. Uh, most recently, let me, Chris let me Falika. Do, go please, Canes. The please, Bear. Well, this was. I saw that during the break. Oh, Stugatz no. looked hurt on that one. On that one, Stugatz looked hurt. He looked over his shoulder, and and Mike was taunting him. Like this was unfair what you did, Mike, and it was mean. It was cruel, actually, because in all of this nonsense that you've done, and it's selfish, and you've like the company is trying to get on on its on its feet, Mike, and like this is disruptive. I'm just playing the message from my good friend, Bad Bunny. Mike, when you came in here with the bear on your phone, because he sent you a personal message, and I guess you decided to share it with everyone, where he's berating Stugatz. The yeah. bear, the Stugatz's beloved bear is saying that Mike has won the bet, and that now, well, do you want to tell people what, what, the bear is saying, because he says now you should shave your head. The the bear is saying flatly. Well, what the if, bear what is your, the one bear, of your idols in this industry. He is saying I should shave my head if I want any chance of getting on college game day again and sitting next to the bear, which I want to do. I've been on it once before. I had a blast doing it. That I should shave my head and Mike doesn't have to. Listen, I love being on college game day. I love the bear. I ain't shaving my head to get on college game day. Sorry. Shave your damn dome. Many nope. are saying, look. As right as I was, and we can all acknowledge in Mike, retrospect, please stop I was this. super right all about right, Can you please stop this? I was super right about Georgia all right, and Alabama. Can, let me just stop. Put that dossier away, Mike. Put the dossier away. Look, I don't like what's you happening like around here. <laughs> Mike, Mike, I want to pay some of these punishments on Sunday. We, we are going to pay. Are you coming to the table? This is what I'm telling you, okay? This is what I'm telling you, and I need you to stop interrupting the content to do this because I want to get on with our lives. Seriously, it's annoying to everybody here what you're doing. Just please stop. We will pay off some of our bets at Metal Arc. I will pay them off. Give me a list. I will pay off my, one of mine on Sunday. Will you pay off one of mine? I No, you uh, will pay uh, off one of yours. Uh, you will pay off one of yours. Uh, I don't know. What are the punishments? So if people subscribe to YouTube.com slash Levitard and Friends, they will see you naked like Prince Fielder. I need to see what the choices are because you've got some <laughs> grid of death punishments that are outstanding yeah. there. Yeah, my uh, dossier provided to me by the great people at Sheets and Giggles. Uh, that what? just covered. Yeah, no, Sheets and Giggles are, is really spearheading the discovery on they all of them. They sponsor the dossier. What are you talking, talking, about? What are you talking oh, about? Sheets and Giggles, absolutely. I couldn't have done this without the tremendous what is, work. Now, what is happening here, though? Hold on. You, I heard, I overheard, and this is the problem when you get the the talent in the in the business part of the business, Stugatz, because I overheard the other day Mike saying. I'm not like he was. He, I don't know who he was shouting it at. I'm not gonna be bullied into shaving my head just because this guy is on the on the. He's gonna get like a quarter million dollars. The sheets and giggles guy is gonna 
he would have to spend if we were to let these unjust results stand. However, Colin from Sheets and Giggles, who may or may not have a horse in this race, led the charge for Discovery and uncovered years of unpaid debts on this show, including the Prince Fielder and the Leopard Sea and the Deaf Poetry Jam. And let's see right here when we got into the Montero, Greg Cody. How dare he start the shape? Well, he's yeah. all right. Hold on a second. This is what I'm telling you, Sheets though, Mike. Just came in with As more. part of these negotiations, <laughs> we not only will your father, Chris, not only will your father cook for us on Sunday, your father's going to pay one of these grid of death punishments. I, I, I saw a little Nas X. Can we get the costume we need in order to get Greg Cody to do Sunday on YouTube as little Nas X? What's that punishment again, Mike? Yes, uh, recreate the Montero photo shoot, which I believe Lil Nas X was with Child in the photo shoot. So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to do something about. All that. right, Mike. Uh, enough. Put it away. Put the dossier away. We'll Thank agree you. to three or four things. No, you haven't done your vroom vroom. Stugat, you've got to do one of these. You've got to do one of these. I have to do one of what? Stugatz, I mean, you one don't of want your... me to keep looking, do you, Dan? Stugat's one of your owed punishments. What, to get Mike to shave his head? On Sunday, just we need to do, we need to advance this story and quit annoying the audience All right. by stopping everything we're doing when with are the you content. Call in, when are you going to do with the casting call, Sugats, which is record and submit a video to America's Got Talent? Hmm? Hmm. When are you, you going to do that? I'm getting to it. When are you going to come in and wear okay, a suit Stugatz, and tie all week? Don't do a bit. I, I have to do that, really? Stugatz, yeah. I, I need you to do it starting Sunday. No, but here is the where, problem. Where I don't know what punishments I owe. Uh, I don't know where the costumes Stugatz, are. Stugatz, like, give me the Depp stuff and I'll do it. Stugatz, when are you dressing up like my good friend John Depp? Wear a suit on Sunday, Stugatz. That's an easy one. Start a week of suit wearing. You say that on he owes Sunday? that one? Start it on Sunday. Mike, would you grant him two or three if he does it on a Sunday? Would you grant him? Just let's dilute this sum and get negotiations over, please, so you that can I go can go back to the table. I'm willing to go back to the table and perhaps and perhaps stop my investigation into the results in Georgia if I see some motivation out of the crew to put their money where their mouth is and get to their debt. Okay, just stop. We'll do some of these on Sunday and we'll figure it out. Let's get back to doing the show, please. I want to get to two things that Jessica was talking about. One of them I gotta buy a suit. was calling Tyler Hero a kid, which was funny because I do imagine Tyler Hero, just based on how he was dressed at the press conference after the game, he is absolutely eating cookies for dinner because he's a 10-year-old. Looked like a Rugrats character. Tyler Hero is somebody I imagine let loose in Miami on on Insta fame, hopped up on Insta fame, with rappers name dropping him. He t he he appears to me with like a ten year old who's getting away with everything. That is just raising himself and absolutely eating candy for dinner because he can. Like just a bathtub full of Skittles because he's uh you know he's he's. He's, He's not got style, though. Like what you're calling, he looks like a kid. Like that is how cool people dr dr drip. Tony's <laughs> from across the room is doing like he's got drip. Yeah, he's got drip. Dan, that's like, thank you, Chris. That's not, but the point well is here is you're saying it in a way that like he's dressing like a kid, and it's like no, he's got style, Dan. I'm sorry. We need to talk about something that happened during the break. So Dan walks in with his sweatshirt on backwards, and Tony says. Can you tell Dan his sweatshirt's on backwards? And so Dan go, goes and fixes it, and Cody says, yeah, but, like, that's the style now. Like, if yeah. Dwayne Wade walked in with his sweatshirt on backwards, we would all think it's that's really I mean. cool. Nowadays, you can do stuff like that, and if you just do it confidently, it becomes style. Wait, Chris. You should do this, Dan. Just start taking chances. Just wear ridiculous things, loud colors. Well, and well just, more ridiculous things. And then just walk in the room like Dan <laughs> Wright. colors. I'm Dan Lebitard, and I'm wearing this combination, and I can. And people will just, you can do it. That's how style works, Dan. You can do anything. Okay. Okay, That's called I, a midlife crisis. I will not take style tips from Chris Cody. <laughs> Stips. But Tyler Hero, please tell me, Stugat, you have not seen how he was dressed in this press conference, correct? It was like his, his clothes was made of crayons, and it was funny. And if you tell me this is style and drip because – Basketball players are so cool that they can wear anything. I've told you. I've seen Russell Westbrook. He's a fashion icon, and he he's wearing skirts and dresses. And Dwayne Wade, I've told you, did one of the most ridiculous photo shoots I've ever seen right here outside on, on Ocean Drive, wearing like a Superman cape. And he looked ridiculous, but it was fashionable for the time because the cooler you are as an NBA young star with some kind of style, I'm guessing John Morant is coming because people just like the way he plays and his attitude combined and all what's the fashion. He's not going to dress like Westbrook is, but 
Tyler Hero looked ridiculous to me as an old man who dresses poorly. He That did not look like style to me. That looked like funny. I can't even imagine how Pat Riley, what Pat Riley thinks watching him. And Pat Riley, like, had a mattress in his van as a surfer bum as a 20-year-old <laughs> with the NBA. Uh, like, I'm guessing Riley's kind of used to it. I mean, Tyler Hero is a young guy. He's feeling good about himself. And I think he does that. Like, I think he does it with purpose. Like, hey, I could pull this off because... I am Tyler Hero, NBA basketball star, where if anyone else was wearing that around in public, we would mock can them. Can you look Perhaps it up, though? Punch them. Can you look yes. it up, please? Can you please look it up for me so that you can see the outfit I'm talking about? Because I don't know. How would you describe it to the audience? It was a matching set. I believe it was tropical, maybe tranky tropy. Yeah. It, when it was floral, and it was really, really nice. And matching sets are having a moment right now. If you go around Miami, you will see nothing but patterned matching sets they're very in style dan do you have any matching sets no no well you should get one what well, this so you thought tyler hero when you saw him come up on stage and he's got a lot of swagger and he plays like he's got with swagger you said because i had this i had this argument in a locker room with Deion sanders 30 years ago where he was telling me no you could wear a mustard colored suit and i'm looking at him and i'm like look at you <laughs> no, you can wear that suit. I cannot wear that suit. And it became a whole racial discussion. He's like, no, it's all about attitude. And I'm like, no, I could never have the attitude to wear that suit. It is about attitude. You can pull off almost anything with supreme confidence. Yeah. Look at Jimmy Goldstein. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything tranky tropey? Can you tell we'll me? settle for anything over the last five years. Anything? Do you have anything that you have recently purchased? Oh, just what Valerie buys me. Yeah. This is just only, yes, it's a bunch what of stuff. What is your newest article of clothing? <laughs> um, shirts the that CBM I'm wearing. <laughs> yes, CBDMD. Yes, yes, the backward CBDMD. <laughs> but just whatever shirts I got. I actually. So you you're done shopping. I bought a tuxedo. I've been done shopping for a decade. You bought Ooh, a tuxedo. That's a matching no, set. I bought, that's relatable. I, I bought a tuxedo last week. Not Tranky Tropy, though. Last, uh, last week I bought, I bought a suit. I don't know, uh, 18 months ago. I thought you were done with suits. Right. Are you not done with suits? Done with suits where? Didn't you start your own? I just kept hearing you, you say, I hate these suits. You, think you were just like, oh, I can't, no more suits ever. I'm starting my own company. God damn all these suits. Why would you need a suit? Why'd you get so many suits? Why'd you go suit shopping? Like, you're never going to wear a suit again. Mike's right about this. The, the, he's really not. Hate suits. You believe that show got canceled. That I can show up. At business meetings, dress the way that I do to do this? I've seen you do it. Like, I haven't used empty suits, empty suits, empty suits. Everywhere I look, empty suits. Because you never wore them, I guess. I was talking about management. Oh! Yeah. More sense. All right, five minutes, Jay Glazer. I was talking about management. A lot of things happening in the NFL. A lot of things. Favre says Rodgers is done. The Bears hired some guy I've never heard of. Yeah, we got to talk about this this Bears hire. Matt Eberflus. I like how <laughs> I like how through politics Favre and Rodgers are able to connect and bond in ways that they never it's did great. in the same it's locker so room. Great. It's great. It's yeah. so good that 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 Favre now, who's gone from legend gunslinger to gray dong shower, uh, just sort Not of allegedly soiled the entirety of his pristine gunslinger image. One of the greatest moments in the history of sports, him playing on a Monday night after his father died. One of the greatest things, most emotional things you will ever see. And man, this country's gotten dark the last 10 years. <laughs> We're seeing a little bit too much of our heroes. Brett Favre, we had a magical run with Brett Favre where he and some other snake oil salesman would appear on here, <laughs> infomercialing their way through Stugats into giving opinions and selling you what? Trinkets of uh, bejeweled fool's gold. I forget what it was, Mike. Yeah, Do you remember? I, we, well, all of a sudden, Brett Favre was available to us anytime we wanted him. Like, didn't, And he wasn't yet disgraced football <laughs> icon. There was some litigation regarding what he was promoting eventually. I heard Aaron Rodgers described as bright Bart Star. Yeah. I heard Chucker <laughs> Carlson. Chucker Carlson got a hearty har har from me. 
A hearty har har. A hearty one. Oh, man. It wasn't just a normal har No, har-har. but Tucker Carlson hates it when you give him a hearty har har in his face. Yeah, Tucker Carlson, not a fan of it. But normally I'd be like, you yeah, know, Rush Lambeau, that was a har har. But Tucker Carlson, whoa, hearty har har. Rush Lambeau was like, I texted people who don't watch sports to tell them that joke and then explain the joke to them. Like that was a that was a big hearty har har for Jess. It also <laughs> looks better than it sounds. Yes, yes. Right? it's yes. more of a visual joke. It is. Yeah. It was Score Sports. We had the CEO on with Brett Favre. There was like a cue in it. And Favre is being sued. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Never talking about Brett Favre reminds me of Deadspin. And did you see what Deadspin did? It's one of the greatest things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I told Jessica before the show to reach out to Deadspin and see if anyone's got a sense of humor about this because it made me think of Stugatz. Well, not about this. Just reach out to Deadspin to see if anyone has a sense of humor. <laughs> I'd really love to talk to Deadspin, Stugatz. I don't think you've seen this story, but it'll certainly resonate with you i'm just going to give you the for for good reason yes for good reason i can replay that sound all right well let's start there let's start by replaying the sound well let what's the best way to deliver this to stu gods because we're going to be informing him of this what's the best way to deliver this to stu gods to get the maximum funny and for the audience to get to enjoy the joke i'm not even gonna do the coachman one like he's complained plenty on twitter i'm not gonna replay it he's obviously not a fan of it We'll move on. Mm. but So let's move on to the David Cully. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what the f*** are the Texans doing? They lose Hopkins, Watson, and then they, and in an attempt to try to uh, impress Deshaun Watson and keep him, they hire a 65-year-old white head coach who's never coached before the NFL. What, who is running that organization? Is, uh, courtesy of Stupidity. Yeah, thank you. What is on the latest Stupidity? What's coming up on Stupidity? Because uh, you are developing quite the following with that parade of meatheads on God Bless Football that you've got. I told Jabba Chamberlain you called him a meathead, and he told me to tell you to go bleep yourself. How about that? Exactly spoken like a meathead would. Well, you got me, meathead. You trampled me. For those that weren't familiar with the David Cully experience in Houston, I know it was a quick ride, but he's black. That's a fairly what? shocking thing for Stugatz to learn. I love that when Stupidity enters the racial waters, they get the race wrong. But speaking of which, Stugatz, look at this correction from Deadspin. Yeah. We learned after the publication of this article that 49ers offensive coordinator Mike McDaniel, whom we described as a white guy, is in fact biracial. We regret the error. What was the story they ran? White guy unfairly getting a chance that should go to black guys. It's one of the great corrections I've ever seen, and I want someone at Dead. I mean, how dumb can you be? <laughs> Jesus. How do you publish the D a whole in Dead story? Dead stands for dumb. <laughs> An entire story based on one premise and then just add a correction and not fully retract the story or like take it down or at least leave it up and retract. Like, I don't un- I don't understand this. But the entire premise was wrong. That's why it's great comedy. And that's why I'd like someone at Deadspin. I mean, I don't know how seriously they take themselves, but this would be quite the artistic turn. Right. If Deadspin once upon a time, the blog coming for everybody at the end here as it's been co-opted and it's not the same thing that it used to be rebellious in spirit run like an old time newspaper sports section? No, no, they actually had journalistic integrity and did research. <laughs> That's kind of a big part of it. And the correction <laughs> is I'd love someone, it's art, it's high art. So I would like this publication to come have a sense of humor about itself because it really did kind of change the game. The intersection of sports radio, Stugatz, and newspapers, Deadspin found a crack where, wait, fans are talking about stuff the way fans talk about stuff, not. The way media covers it with its Hall of Fame, and they developed, without any access, a huge following and did journalism from within it. But it's been diluted in ways I can't even explain. This happened when I was on my honeymoon or something. Like They did some good journalism. They also paid for stories back in their day. I don't know what they're doing right now, except I guess they're borrowing from that legacy, but they're totally tainting whatever... Uh, legacy it did have entering it. It's just... Well, this is not the way to get them to come and talk about it and have a sense of humor no, about it's it. Not, but no. I wish that we could have a sense of humor about things like this because we've rarely done anything funnier than what happened with <laughs> you and Jonathan, Coach. <laughs>
Oh, there it is already. Stugatz, Stugatz saying hello for the first time in four years and securing your services for free next week. Stupidity and elsewhere. Uh, it makes me happy to see your face, buddy, and I want to tell the audience uh, what I, I, I only know you from afar. I know the people who are your closest friends are really strong allies and know you really well, and you've done a new book, Unbreakable, How I Turned My Depression and Anxiety into Motivation, and you can too. It's available now, and the reason I'm so happy to see this guy, okay, because I've marveled at his entire career, was going to be a stand-up comic, hustled and uh, his way unbelievably into the information NFL game, and then pioneered it, owned it, um, casually made relationships with players as most mainstream media was making its relationships with the executives and told, like really changed the way this stuff is done in the information business. And I'm happy to see the evolution of you as a man. I've talked to you about how much you love your family. But to be talking openly about this stuff, Jay, when you're MMA guy, when you're football guy, talking openly about when you're military guy, when you're doing amazing work with yeah. military heroes, uh, and now you turning your insides out and giving the audience your vulnerability, I just think it's extraordinary extraordinarily cool what you've done with the platform, Jay. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. I think because I'm in football and fighting, that gives me the security to open up and like, no one's questioning my manhood, so I could cry in the drop of a dime. You're not going to call me a wuss or tell me to suck it up and, and be honest with you. Um, I think vulnerability is a lot stronger than, you know, these and muscles. So, um, man, God bless me with a great voice to be able to, not today, but God bless me with a great voice. <laughs> to be able to use my own struggles, which is, um, man, these struggles are every day. And I never knew who I'm gonna wake up with in the morning. Like I, I never knew who I'm gonna get <clears throat> when I wake up. So every single day, and like I, I've never taught, like you and I have been friends for a while. We used to say Glazer's crazy, right? It's funny and, and football and fighting, crazy is a badge of honor. What y'all never knew is, um, yeah, it was crazy, but I was in a lot of pain. And I still am. So now I'm able to kind of turn it into words and give other people those words so they can start having this conversation. I'm not so alone anymore. So I can, you know, because I'm talking about it now, now that I'm able to talk about it with other people, I want to give other people the resources and the voice to be able to talk to their family and friends about it. But I think it's fair to say, though, to Jay, and I'm not friends the way Strahan and these guys are with friends, but it was also pretty well hidden, though. It's not like I, you're, you were in some pain, but also it was might have been a badge of honor for you. Hey, nobody's going to ever see this pain. You know, it's, it's funny because I started having, again, I, I call it the gray. And the gray for me is depression and depression's little jagoff sister anxiety. And um, it, it, I started having my first anxiety attack, and it's weird. In 2005, I was alone in, in the Raider Stadium. I was waiting to do a hit for Fox. There was nobody there. No, not a single soul. And man, boom! This anxiety attack came on. And when you have an anxiety attack, for people out there who want to know what it's like, then you feel like you're having a heart attack. And the wall. Eyes darting around, and my heart starts going. I start sweating everywhere, and my hands start shaking. And I honestly don't even know what I'm saying. Well, then it happened the next week, and the next week, and the next week. And this is 2005, so this is before we started talking about mental health. This is before we started, you know, giving it these names and anxiety attacks and depression. Like, so I had to go at it alone. And I've been more open about, I guess, the depression, the anxiety attacks. And, and literally, Strahan said to me the other day, like, I never told him until the other day. And he's like, why? I said, because I don't want to bring down your guys' day. Like, we're in the middle of a show. So every single time you see me on Fox and NFL Sunday, from 2005 on, I've had an anxiety panic attack, massive, before the first segment. And that's what, what you'll see from me is I'll try and crack a joke or smile or something along those lines because that gets me through it. The faster I can laugh, the faster I can get through it. But if you see me up there also, my hands are shaking, or I'm actually going through it as we speak. Jay, I wanted to talk to you about this. Again, the new book, Unbreakable, How I Turned My Depression and Anxiety into Motivation, and you can too, because I, I want people to understand that his story is extraordinarily personal. And this, this part of it, Jay, because you were 
uh, you were hidden, and now you're talking about something with with anxiety attacks here. Stugatz and I have had this conversation across 15 years. I remember Butch Davis was having anxiety attacks, and we had a sports radio argument about, you know, for $10 million, I'd take some panic attacks. And this might have been around 2005. Uh, can you articulate to people, because I don't think they understand, how you do not want five seconds of this particular hell? Jay, are you okay, by the way? Do you need a moment? Like, are you okay? Oh, I'm good right now. I'm okay right now. Okay. Uh, my voice is a little gone. No, no, I, okay. I love, um, no, the more I talk about it to the world, the more therapeutic it is. When I hold it in, that's where it gets a little scary. So, like, for me, to get through the gray, I need a team. And by me talking about it, this allows me to get more teammates throughout the world. I get to walk this walk with other people. And and then, so, having a team and then, um, you know, be, being uh, living in gratitude and being of service, this allows me to be of service. But what you just said, look, I, I know people look at it and go, how could this guy have this? He's rich. He has fame. How could, and yes, like my life is great. Don't get me wrong. I understand my life is great on the outside, but between my ears sucks. And you know, it, it's funny, like, again, you guys know I got involved in the mixed martial arts early, 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 early days. And I'm proud of every one of my scars from getting my head kicked in by Chuck Liddell or getting slammed by Randy Couture or wrestling with Wayne Johnson or, or Andrew Whitworth or all these guys. Like, I'm proud of all my you know, ruptured L4, L5, four times, L1, L2, twice, herniated C2, three, four, five. I always brag about those scars. Now I'm starting to brag about my mental scars. And I want to give it the same pride. Everybody else like, there's no shame in it. Dude, I'm messed up. But I'm good with my messed upness. I want everybody to be like that. We got to fight this thing together. Uh, forgive me, Jay. I did not hear you correctly, perhaps. I may have missed it because I thought you said that you would go through anxiety attacks when you were on Fox before the pregame shows, it's been happening from 2005. I, I, I might have missed. Were you saying that you were having one right now? That you were having? No, 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 no. no, no. He asked if I was okay. No, not. I'm not having one right. That's, so here's the wild. That's thing. why I asked, Jay. We thought we we thought oh. you were going through one right now. I, I thought right. I heard you. I thought I heard you saying that you, it still happens week to week right now. That yeah. you will before you go on, you might have an anxiety attack. That's how I heard oh. what you had said. It happened every single week from 2005 until this year. And I was like, man, I, I started this year. And I was like, I don't, wow, the, I haven't had one week one, then week two, then week three. I had one last week, which is bizarre, after our show, out of nowhere, like in our post game meeting. And I was like, when I turned to Kurt Menefee, and I was like, dude, I just had, and I opened up my jacket, it was just sweat. But here's what happened. And here's what I think got me through it. When I was doing the interview with Lane Johnson earlier this year, where we sat down and when Lane went off the reservation, and I don't think this made the, the interview, I said, you know, give us some things that, that have helped you or that maybe can help people at home. He said, journal it. He said, I've realized that journaling has really helped. And as he said that, I'm like, oh my God, I wrote the book. I'm not having these before I go on anymore. There it is. So again, I, and that's why I'm doing this too. Like the more we could talk about it, the more help I get from other people. Like we walk this walk together, the more ideas I get. So I had no clue. Now I still get them here and there. And here's the, here's the crazy is I'm great in chaos. Like inside a cage, right before Randy Couture is about to smash my head in, I am great on TV. Great, I love it. So I, I suck in calm, I'm great in chaos. So I don't really understand why I have them going into every time I'm doing a show or in the middle. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. But again, this thing plays by its own set of rules. There's no, there really is no set guidebook for every one of us. We all deal with it differently. We just got to talk about it. It is interesting, though, Jay, that you would learn. It really is because I, I love uh, what a meathead you were back in the days, early 20s, where you're making... Well, you're making these, but you're making these connections with these guys, at least in part because you were more like the athletes than the executives. And so you're reporting on things from the athlete's perspective and you get to become the insider that Schefter is. And you, you, you invented it. You made it yourself by being an information guy who had 
everything because as a young 20-year-old, you connected with athletes in an unusual way. It's fascinating to hear you, a former sports writer, say, oh, there was so much learning and just talking about my feelings and writing them down and being okay with, I don't have to headbutt you to win arguments which you would actually do physically, I could talk about how my father hurt me or I can talk about some of the weak parts of my personality and not be a pussy. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the way um, when I, you know, start the book, I, and you know the journey, my first 10 or 11 years, I was making 9,700 bucks a year. And I looked at it, I said, hey, I'm not, like, I walked in that giant locker room in 93, I said, I'm going to be the last dude standing here. I'm not going to outwork him by a little, but by a lot. 9,700 bucks and to outwork them all by a lot, that meant 80, 90 hour weeks. So I couldn't have like 40 hours there and then another 40 hour job of bartender, or bouncer or boxer or whatever. Um, like I just, just had to do that. And, and you buried uh, everyone and you buried everyone. You got, you got, you got, more, nothing, you, right? got and, you got more news than anybody though. Nobody was covering the team. No one had the information you had. No one. Thank you. I appreciate that. But as I started, you know, I finally got my first full-time job, you know, in 99. So I started in 89. Um, man, I, all of a sudden, bam, you know, I, and I became the first minute-by-minute minute insider, Len Pascarelli and I, to start breaking news on that internet thing that I think is going to, you know, catch on. <laughs> um, and then we started going from there. And all of a sudden, boom, I, you know, I got a six-figure job. I went from 9,700 bucks to 50 grand, then 100 grand, then 130. Like, well, and as I started going up the ladder, and I got to Fox and we're, man, we're Fox Interval Sunday, which is a dream job. And man, we, we got inducted to the television hall of fame a few years ago. And my God, and you think, man, it's going to be rainbows and unicorns. But unless you learn to love yourself from the inside out, which I don't know how to do, like <laughs> trying to, to get a little choked up here, but again, this is, I'm good with my vulnerability here. Um, I don't have a concept of how to love myself from the inside out. Like, I don't have a concept. Like, the guy you all see, man, I don't see that guy. So it's hard. So this motive, my depression, anxiety, has ended up motivating me. It's been a, it's been a curse, but it's been a blessing, too. It's motivated me to go do all these great things and become that first insider and this MMA guy and all this other stuff. It's motivated me to try and get out, love from the outside in and hope to figure out a way that maybe I could meet in the middle someday. And then again, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm still on my journey. So I, I just know I can get love from the outside, but we, we describe and in that chapter when I say, man, I finally made it, but here's the truth of it. Like this is, you see me laughing on TV. It's a mask, you know? And you know, I, I don't, I don't got the Napoleon complex for being short. I got the depression complex. Hmm. I got to overdo it. Because of that, you got to be physically stronger than everyone. You got to get in the cage with Ricky, Richie Incognito, and you got to wow. beat him up. You got to be more of a physical bull, tough than, on the outside, than right. than every athlete. And, la and and also big personality, right? I'm I'm hiding it. And in the book, you talked about these relationships. It was a year ago this week that I was in Cabo with Sean McVay and, and Andrew Whitworth. Um, and that's when Stafford happened to check in our hotel. Happened to. And I'm serious. He just happened to. But McVeigh asked, who's talking to Whip and I, and he's like, so, I, you know, I kind of don't understand it. Tell me more, like, your depression, anxiety. And we start telling him, I said, Sean, and I'm telling you this because this is the chapter in the book that I described, depression, anxiety. Sean, this whole thing to all our readers out there, through me trying to teach Sean McVay about the gray and anxiety and depression. And he's like, man, like, I, I don't get it. I said, you don't get it because like your, your, your life is a nightlight. Like, you know, the worst thing that ever happened to you is you lost the Super Bowl in your second year as head coach, as the youngest head coach ever. <laughs> and your parents look like the people that are in the picture frames when you buy picture frames. Like you don't get this, right? And, and I'm like, think how much better coach you could be if you can understand it. And Witt's like, and I said, all your players, man, they all got to be crazy. You got to be crazy to be on this level. And he looks at Wit, and we, he's like, you too? And Andrew's like, what do you think gets me to go do this to people every week? Hmm. Yeah, Sean, of course me. And he's like, well, I said, Sean, think how much better of a coach you could be if you can learn this. And he said, well, how many of my players do you think have it? And I said, that's not the question you need to ask yourself. How many of my players 
how many of my secretaries, how many of my assistants, how many of my scouts. Like, even if you don't have the clinical version that I have, man, we just went through a pandemic, right? We've been isolated. You got some form of gray. We see our things on social media all the time. We're comparing ourselves to everybody else's filtered fraction of a second. And all of a sudden we think our lives suck. We, we feel left out. We feel unworthy. So this book and this conversation is to help everybody who has some form of gray. And he got it. And halfway through this year, when they were struggling, he called me. He's like, man, I'm, I'm so glad we had this conversation. I've been a lot more vulnerable with my team. And that was pretty damn cool. Jay, I am stunned by that story that a boy genius NFL coach would not know that his players' minds would need a kind of care too because, of course, they would be hidden in that military school. Well, he knew. He didn't know, like I described it. So he knew guys had issues. He didn't know what it felt but, like. But how could we you let him know what it felt I like? When I say we let him know what it felt like, yeah, but, we we scared the crap out of him that night. <laughs> but but how, <laughs> how 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 can an NFL boy genius not know that Whitworth? I understand a guy a, a guy who is a pillar of NFL integrity, unbelievable tough yeah, guy. Do do? Um, but of course, like the, because that sport, uh, what we've been talking about this week, Jay, is that sport's not mentally healthy. Like just the doing of everything that's being done out there. That entire sport and everything around it is something that tests the mental health of any sane person. Dan, I'm going to give you a story right here. This will kind of sum up why Sean uh, was like, wow. So, you know, Strahan's been my best friend for 30 years, 1993, right? So here I could talk to all our combat vets in my, in my charity about it. And strangers, no problem. All the NFL players who are part of MVP, no problem. Um, I talked to Howie Long about it. Talked to Kurt Menefee. They're they're my therapists on set. Like Howie and Kurt could tell when I'm having a manic episode or my sky is falling. They're like, hey, 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 Howie has been, oh man, incredible. Like, God almighty, he's been, man, my favorite. He gets the monster in the box that a lot of us have to have. He'll grab me, hey, hey, your sky's not falling. I got you, which is incredible. So Strand has been my best friend for 30 years. Two months ago, we're supposed to go do dinner. And man, this thing woke me up in the middle of the night. Like the monster just came out of the box. And when I get, when the gray really comes out, kicks my ass, <clears throat> it physically affects me. So I get, I feel behind my heart, like in my heart, behind my rib cage, I'd say, on the left side of my gut, only the left side. Um, and you hear things right about, hey, you feel something in your gut, or go with your gut. And then my joints ache, man, like, like it's a horrible rainy day. And I feel like I've been in a 50 round fight. And this day in particular just kicked my butt. And I called Stray and I said, hey man, I can't go to dinner tonight. He said, well, I said, man, monster just got out of the box. Man, it just whipped my ass today, I just can't go. And he said, um, well, I'm gonna come over. I said, no. He said, you wanna talk about it? I said, I do, but not tonight, I just wanna go to sleep. And then he said, uh, this, this chokes me up. I said, he said, I've known you for 30 years. Why have you never told me? I never said this to him in 30 years. So every time I was having some one of these days, man, I would just suck it up and go out and 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 lose control sometimes out and um sometimes take Vicodin to deal with it to go out and you know just like to mask it any way I possibly could. And he said, Why have you never told me? I said, But the point is, what I want people, your listeners to understand that, look at his reaction, right? A lot of us have this shame. I said, for some reason, I was just ashamed with you. He's like, but I'm your best friend. I'm like, I, I, don't, know how to, I don't know how to answer it. But if I told him 30 years ago, I would have had a guy who would have said for 30 years, I'm on the way. Let's get on the phone. I got you. 30 years, I could have somebody walk in that walk with me. So that's why I'm writing this damn book. It's time to take all this shame and stigma and, and shove it out the window and, you know, connect with our loved ones. I guarantee you someone you have no idea um, is sitting right next to you an awful lot going through and just don't know how to say something. 
What a powerful healing, right? Because you've always been boys, boys with Strahan. Like, just yeah, that, that's the guy, you guys. Well, but, I mean, no, foxhole together, guys. Like, friendship, three decades. Yes. Uh, the idea that you would hide that from him when when you know the healing. Uh, I, I could see Mike it's being. A source of shame I could for see, him But I could see Mike being almost hurt by that. Why didn't you tell me? I would have helped you. Like, well, I would have been right there for you, dude. Like, what has well, the, Jay? What has the reaction been? Not just from Strahan, just in general. What has the reaction been? Oh God, the most positive experience of my entire life. Like I'm so grateful. I'm glad I did this. Like I had, um, I had a grandmother this week. Grandmother, reach out. I've had a lot of people like this reach out, and I'll say, I'm a grandmother. For all these years, I didn't have words to describe this and have the conversation with my family. I do now. But think how powerful that is. After 80 years, this woman can now have this conversation with her family and describe it. Or I've had a lot of girl dads reach out and say, wow, you know, my daughter's going through it and I don't get it. So now I can connect with her on this. And a lot of people have said, my kids who watch all the time, like, wow, Jay has it. Oh, it's pretty cool. Like as in, you know, they were on the same team and it, it, it taken away a lot of the shame. So I have gotten, you know, we're, we're, Social media is usually a cesspool of hate. I have had nothing, like it turns out we can actually use it for good. And I started journaling on my social media a few weeks ago. Like I didn't want to wait for the book to come out. And I was like, you know, if I'm gonna do a book, I want people to see what this is like in real time. So when I'm struggling, you're gonna see it. You know, we're gonna walk this walk together. When I'm having good days, I'm gonna tell you why. I'm really gonna explain it. And as I've done that, it's been 99.9% positive social media where I'm saying, hey, you have, an issue, list it down here and let's all help each other out. Let's lift each other up. Let's walk this walk together. You got something to celebrate? Let's celebrate it with you also. It's been incredible. It's it's every time I've opened up to somebody about it. And, and here's the other thing. I have, you know, I always started, I, I've talked about it in the MVP circle for six years, but I always started kind of talking about it publicly. I wrote something for The Athletic a couple of years ago. And that's really what prompted this. And I don't think anything of it because I'm proud of my scars. So I wrote it and then all of a sudden, whoa, the reaction, like, what, like, oh my God, you too? So I was like, wow, this is, man, this is what God put me here to do. And um, it, it's, it's been, every time I've opened up to somebody about it, one of my friends, football fighting, whatever, it has gotten us so much closer together. Happy for your healing, Jay. The new book, Unbreakable, How I Turned My Depression and Anxiety into Motivation, and you can too, because I think I want to talk to you more about this at another time, but I think you've gotten just great healing from unleashing whatever were your repressions, like you're now sharing. your I'm everybody else, and if I could lift everybody else up, like there's three pillars to this, and, and it's a prescriptive book. It's not so much of a, a memoir. It's more of, hey, this is where, you know, things that happen in my life, but these are things I do, and you know, one of them is being of service. Two is, 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 uh, you know, having a team. The third one is laughter. But the first two, that's what this does for me. This book is to be of service to other people, you know, and for us to build a team because that gets us all through the gray. Let's see if we can get some laughter. We know you got to get out of here. So yeah. we'll, we'll say goodbye on this, but he's a former stand up comic and we do a looks like game around here where we just make fun of the way that people look and say, do the way these people look, uh, does it fit with something that could be funny? So I'm explaining the game to you. And does Jay does Jay Glazer look like a manager for a gothic themed pro wrestler? A gothic themed? No, more no. for me that thing. No. Uh, does Jay Glazer look like the jewelry counter clerk at your local 24 hour pawn shop? You do. Absolutely. You do, yeah. But no doubt. Are you kidding me? I look like I'm in the diamond district. I look like at the door, making sure you don't knock off the place in the diamond district. <laughs> do you look like the ringmaster of a traveling three ring circus that is two weeks away from bankruptcy? <laughs> no, he didn't like that one. Uh. It's a it's a very flourishing. You'll know right away. Very yes. flourishing and not it's a it's a it's a, it's a circus that's not near bankruptcy. It's a flourishing circus. <laughs> oh yes, there we go. Yes, perfect. Yes. Okay, yes. <laughs> with, with, yes absolutely. Does your Jay, does Jay Glazer look like your hometown friend who grew up to be the local bookie that you owe money, and after he threatens your life, he asks you how your mom's doing? <laughs> no, I think if I had like a comb over, yes.
Okay. Jay, thank you, sir. Thank you for sharing uh, your story. Thank you for sharing the book. I'll talk to you. Uh, I'll talk to you off air because I really do want to catch up. Love you all. Appreciate you guys. Thank you, Jay. When's the last time you did drugs? <laughs> I've never done a drug in my life. Wow. What? Not surprising. He does not never, drink either. Never, never tasted drink. alcohol, never done pot, never try, tried any drug in my life other than, wow. you know, an aspirin or a Tylenol. Really? In all your travels huh. uh, and meetings with indigenous yeah. people, you never sat around a campfire and they gave you a plate of something that you're like, wow, this has a funny yeah. effect on me. Yeah. Uh, no, they've given me plates of stuff that uh, the only effect they had on me might be to vomit, but other than that, no. Have you ever been tempted? Because I can't imagine you even being tempted. And if that temptation arose, it would be uh, a lot, uh, you know, in high school or something, not now. You know, I, I haven't been tempted. And it's because I think I know I have a very addictive personality. Right. And I, I would be one of those people that if I something I really liked, it would be hard for me not to do it again. So um, I don't want to I don't want to dip my toes in that water. Addictive personality is, uh, do you associate it or link it at all to the way that you were passionate about animals where your passion was extreme from very early in life? None of the other kids were like you when it came to caring about animals, correct? No, but you meant That's no true. one, you meant no one your age who was in the world you were in, correct? That's true. I was called the nerd, the weirdo, all that kind of stuff because I was so infatuated with animals but that that's true and it you know maybe it is that part of my personality i just you know i'm one of these people who go all in and that's it do you remember the start of all that like the roots of your animal love and fascination do you remember the very earliest age that that grabbed you yeah it was a squirrel that came up to me in my backyard in new york city uh and and took a peanut out of my hand and i thought my god this the squirrel is my friend and I looked at its big eyes and I just thought to myself, this is a special animal. And then I got to bond with the other squirrels and I got them to all come in. Then I got the pigeons. And um, it was just like, you know, it was like, I didn't, in the beginning, I didn't have a whole lot of friends. I was such a gawky kid. I was so tall and gangly, um, even as a young boy, five, six, seven years old, um, that, uh, you know, I had friends and animals. The squirrel, was that a process or the first time it came and grabbed a peanut or you were trying to lure it, tempt it over time? I remember sitting in my backyard and again, I must've been five or six years old. I know this is gonna sound crazy to a lot of people. Uh, and I remember the squirrel kind of walking up to me. Uh, it didn't immediately take the peanut out of my hand, but uh, I remember I would go in the yard every day and it would get closer and closer. And then that day when it took the peanut out of my hand, I said, oh, wow, this is, and then from then on, it would wait for me and come down and very willingly come up and take whatever I had in my hand out. Probably not the right thing for me to do, but it was something that created a bond. I have never asked you about this, but can you sort of articulate for us the spiritual and soulful connection that you have to animals beyond, like you have legitimate relationships with animals, but is there a way for you to articulate why and how you care the way you do? You know, the way I can put it in, in, in terms that everybody I think can relate to is anybody who's had a dog, you know, you, you leave all day for work, all day, and you have a miserable day at work, and your dog is home alone all day. Uh, and instead of when you come to the door, the dog looks at you like, I can't believe you left me home all day alone. That dog comes up to you like you're the greatest thing that's in its life at that time. I always say to myself, I want to be the person my dog thinks I am. Um, well, you get that from animals in general. I think animals have this this sense about knowing good people. You know, I, I'll tell you, I, there's a bunch of people that have said, you know, I don't... Uh, I don't trust people who don't like animals. If somebody says to me, I hate animals, I hate, that's somebody I've got to keep an arm's length from because it just frightens me. I just think, I don't know how you can be that way. Um, you know, I, and I understand people have had some bad experiences with animals, but I, I hope they also understand that those bad experiences probably stem from bad experiences presented to those animals by people in the first place. Um, so there's something, there's something pure, clean and honest about animals that uh, in a world today, sometimes I find a hard time trusting some people. You know, especially when you get more in the public eye, I think you, you wonder what people want, what people are asking for, or what people are, you know, you never wonder that with animals because they don't care what the hell you do. They just care about you. And I just think, I just think that, you know, they haven't, 
a way of knowing that even with wild animals and you know i don't want to give the, the wrong impression or go out and oh my gosh you're going to see a you know a florida panther in your yard and go out there and try to feed it a chicken because it's going to love you no no don't do anything stupid like that but i mean you can see things just in some therapies what they do with their horses with kids with dolphins with you know kids with uh, autistic children how animals sometimes seem to know you can see that in people with domestic dogs you know you can see how sometimes if an adult is a jerk to the dog the dog's going to you know, and yet you see a baby come by and pull that dog's ears and do all, and the dog just knows, listen, it's a baby. Um, you know, again, there are exceptions to all of this. It's just in my general experience, I've seen things in animals that I wish I saw more of in people. Speaking of dogs, uh, Ron, uh, my wife wants a dog, but I'm looking for a dog that's not going to shed. So what's the best yeah. dog I can get for a house with a child? That doesn't oh, shit. He's going to go miniature, miniature schnauzer. Miniature schnauzer, brother. Yeah. Miniature schnauzer is the absolute, I, you know, I know I'm biased because my miniature schnauzer was like our third child. Uh, I've never known a dog that knew children better, tolerated things more, didn't shed, didn't have any bad habits. I mean, this dog was, my, my wife kept saying, I'm looking for the zipper to take the fur off to find the little boy inside. Um, that dog, a good miniature schnauzer <laughs> is one of the greatest dogs you could ever have. Ron, which animal do you imagine would most like drugs? <laughs> Any animal. What do you mean? Like drugs. Any animal would like drugs if given the opportunity to have them because generally speaking, they don't know better. You see animals get addicted to things. You know, I talk about the amarula tree in Africa that produces this fruit that ferments into an alcohol that gets animals drunk. And sure enough, the baboons, the elephants, they learn about that. And every year that season when those amarula fruits are coming down, they'll get there and they just suck it up until they're basically plastered. Um, so that's a drug, you know, that, that once an animal can learn to, to get that feeling, it's, it's just a natural, I think, a natural response. You want more. So you get addicted. Ron, in ancient Roman mythology, Romulus and Remus were raised by a wolf. So going back to the topic of, of dogs being part of your family, would it be possible for a wolf or a dog to raise babies as their own and, and like, add them to their pack? Well... Logistically, no, unless that baby was already weaned because the carnivore cannot produce the type of milk that would sustain a baby, an infant. Um, the wolf would not produce the, the, that milk needed for the infant. Now, if it was to find a child that had been weaned and was already on solid foods, um, I've seen stranger things. Uh, I'm not gonna say that it's, that it's impossible, it's improbable, but I'm not gonna say it's impossible that it could be taken into a pack and fed and brought food and the, the, the child could learn to feed. I know that's been taken to extremes in some films, but um, I do think that there is a maternal instinct in some animals to adopt things. I've seen that with lions and antelope that they eat. You know, an antelope, unfortunately, they, they couldn't feed the antelope, okay? They, they, they protected the antelope, but they couldn't feed and the antelope ended up starving to death. Um, but the maternal instinct was there to protect the antelope, to, to be next to it all the time, something that they normally would eat. So, you know, animals, I think, never cease to surprise us. Ron, I read that the oldest male gorilla in the world passed away yesterday at the Atlanta Zoo. Um, it was 61 years old. My question would be, how do the aging process of animals that get that old mirror ours? almost exactly the same. You know, you start doing things like you might start losing teeth. You get a tooth infection that can lead to, you know, a fatal disease. You start losing your eyesight. You lose your, your reflexes, your instincts, your strength. Um, you, you lose that, 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 that body texture that you had and something like a gorilla that's incredibly necessary, you know, to, to survive in the wild that way. That's why that animal probably lived a lot longer under human care than it would have lived in the wild. Um, so these animals, the same geriatric processes that you see in human beings happen in animals, which is why most animals live longer under human care than they do in the wild, because they're catered to for that. You know, in the wild, if you, if, if you lose your strength and you can't hunt anymore, you're going to starve. But in human care, you presented the food, you're catered to that way. You provided medications to help, you know, ease pain for extreme arthritis, which is something that's very common in animals uh, that can be debilitating and in fact fatal in many, many instances. So you'll, you'll see the same geriatric processes in animals as you see in humans. What you don't see is you don't see animals um, 
reflecting those things. They don't demonstrate pain. They don't demonstrate, um, you know, being compromised out of instinct. They'll disguise those things because they know once they show that they're going to be predated on by something else. They're going to be outcompeted by something else. So by the time you see an animal in the wild having a bad limp or, or being slow and not having, a, it's usually very far along in that degenerative process. I want to read something to you from the New York Times. A female monkey in a nature reserve in Japan violently overthrew the alpha male of her troop to become the first female leader in the reserve's 70-year history. She presides over 677 monkeys, but a messy love triangle could endanger her status. What's happening there? Well, uh, you know, uh, the female of all species is starting to, uh, well, not starting to in many ways already for a long time, has understood that, you know, they're, they're just as powerful, just as important, and uh, many times have the ability to lead as well or better than males. And um, this is something that is, I think, being found across species lines. There are several species of animals where they are uh, uh, maternal, they, they are matriarchal. You know, hyenas, for instance, it's the females that are larger than the males. They, they, they run the show. Birds of prey, it's the females that are larger than the males. They, they're the ones who usually just make the, the big decisions. Um, you know, so to see this in a primate now, it's not terribly unlike what we see in humans. You know, for, the, for too long a time, I think that uh, females were, were not given the equal credit that, that they deserved as, 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 as men get the credit. Um, and perhaps you're seeing this evolve now in, in some of the lower species of primates also. So this is something that I think is just, it's an evolution of survival. The survival of the fittest, which not doesn't always necessarily mean the strongest, but it could also mean the smartest. Intelligence uh, is just as important as strength. Fascinating. Put it on the poll, Guillermo. <laughs> Did you know that the Me Too movement had arrived in the monkey kingdom as well? Ron, have you heard about hamsters in Hong Kong where they're rounding up hamsters and killing them because one of them tested positive for COVID? So now they have kind of like it sounds like a secret underground situation where people are fostering hamsters to keep them alive. <laughs> I had not heard about that. No. It seems to be an extreme knee jerk reaction to something. Um, but, you know, again, p panic is one of these things. Panic, misinformation, being misunderstood uh, leads to these kinds of tragic responses. Um, I hope it's not something that uh, will continue. Um, but, you know, the fact is animals do. Uh, are able to get COVID. Uh, we've seen that in several species. But, um, you know, what would be that thought process if people thought that about human beings? Guillermo, put this on the poll as well. Are animals more pure, cleaner, more honest, and better than humans? I want to get to Ron McGill's top five. Well, that last one, better than humans. Now, I, that, take that word out. Leave the rest in there, and I think the poll would be incredibly one-sided. I mean, they lick their butts and their wieners. I mean, well, we and you would, would do the same if you do could. Do I would. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I can't you, reach. I try. You, you more than most. You more than most. And Joe Rogan says he could. Joe Rogan oh, says, get he, Joe, he says he's he so, says a lot of stuff. He says but. he's so flexible that he could. So you, <laughs> I want to get a top five list from you here, Ron, on animals unusual animals that you have just felt like this animal can tell I am a good person. This animal trusts me and I'm surprised that it trusts me because you've also found yourself in some danger for, for misreading some of those situations. Have you not? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, um, you know, that I, I, I've, I think you've been here and I've, I've introduced you to the chimpanzee Samantha here at the zoo. Uh, Samantha, generally speaking, doesn't like very many people at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, she really dislikes most people. Um, for whatever reason, she really likes me. And there's a sense of, gosh, it's like a connection there. There's a bond. When I see her, I get happy. She sees me. She gets happy. We hoot and pan hoot to each other. just, <laughs> And she does the same thing. And I know it sounds kind of corny. It just makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. It really does. She seems to to know my feelings for her are that I really care about that animal. I want her to be as comfortable, as happy as possible. Um, and I feel that she feels the same way with me. Um, so that's one animal. Another animal that people would not necessarily think can show any kind of affection, and not that he shows affection, but it's Goliath, the Galapagos tortoise, a 525 pound tortoise that is over hundred years old. 
he just hears my voice and his head goes up like a periscope and he comes walking at me as fast as he can. I mean, it's tortoise warp drive, but it's, you know, somewhat slow. But the fact that he comes at me as soon as he can follows my voice and it just comes right up waiting for me to scratch his neck. I tell you, that's just a really, really good feeling. Um, you know, they're a giraffe. I think you've been here with me too, Dan, where I call their names. They'll be on the other side of the exhibit and, and I'll call their names. And I make these crazy sounds when I call their names and they perk up and they come walking right over. And even the people at the giraffe feeding station will say, gosh, you know, we've been calling them all morning. They don't pay any attention to us. And, and they come over. Now I realize that a lot of this is their association with me and my association with food. Every time they see me, I usually have something that they really like. Um, so I'm not trying to kid myself. But there are times when I try to say, well, you know, maybe it's also me too. Uh, and that, that makes me feel special. And it's the same thing with the elephants. But the number one, the number one moment I will never forget is when I first started here, there was a tigress, her name was Natasha. And whenever, for whatever reason, whenever she saw me, she would chuff. It was a, it's a happy sound in tigers where they look at you and they kind of go. <laughs> and that is a calming thing. And I would see her back in her holding area in the night house and she would come right up right up to the barrier there to me, she'd go, and I go, and she'd rub up against the bars. And you know, there was a feeling I said, gosh, I wish I could almost go in there and want to just scratch her back. Of course, I would have been stupid. But I thought there was a special bond there. And that was cemented the day she had her cubs. First time ever, first time mom cubs. She had her cubs back in the den. And I tell you, I still get goosebumps thinking about it. I went up right up to the enclosure and she was back in the den and she saw me and she grabbed her cubs in her mouth and she walked out and placed them right in front of me for me to see them and laid down and just chuffed as if, I know this sounds anthropomorphic. I know the people are gonna say, oh, Ryan, you know, you're being stupid. It's a, you know, it's just coincidence, whatever. She laid down there and she chuffed and she showed me her newborn cubs. And anyone who's worked with these animals, you know, the maternal instinct is incredibly protective of their cubs. Um, a tiger, generally speaking, would never let you get close to her cubs. And yet she brought them out to me, laid down, kind of closed her eyes and chuffed with her cubs there right in front of me. It's a moment I will remember for the every last breath I have. Did you cry? I did. I how, did. how often has an animal moved you from happiness? I know you grieve when you lose them, but how, how often does that happen? Um, you know, happiness in that animals recover from things. Uh, Samantha is one of those animals. She was an animal that uh, had gotten really, really sick. Um, and the veterinarians called and asked if I would come back there. You know, just like uh, you have a family member in a hospital bed that's really, really sick. Uh, sometimes it's good that they see family members that helps lift their spirits. And they thought, well, maybe because everybody was aware of Samantha's bond with me, that if she saw me, she would feel better. And she had been literally in kind of a fetal position in the corner of her enclosure, just not moving, not saying anything. And when I went back there and I just kind of went, oh, oh, she looked at me oh, 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 and she came right over and put her, presented her back for me to groom her back. And, you know, she literally, that was kind of like the beginning of her rebounding from this illness that she had, of which she's made a full, full recovery, thank goodness after that. But, you know, moments like that make me cry that, uh, that you could have uh, an impact on an animal like that. Um, and, and I, you know, you, you'll see countless examples of that on YouTube, on, on the internet of people reconnecting with an animal they haven't seen for years. Uh, and yet that animal remembers, you know, that's the thing about animals. There's a pure honesty about them. Um, and, and a memory that people don't give them, you know, we always hear about the memory of an elephant. I think a lot of animals remember things that we don't give them credit for. Ron, the same way that good animals are attracted to good people, is it possible that bad animals sense that energy and are attracted to bad people? <laughs> no, you, know, you know, Billy, the, 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 I know Dan's laughing. It may sound a little bit of a, an extreme no, opposite. It's like an there, evil internship I, program. I, I, think, I think that's possible. And I think just like people, there are bad animals. There are animals, especially the more intelligent the animal, depending on how it was raised, there can be animals that have malice in their in their minds and, 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 and are aggressive for no other reason other than being aggressive, again, as a result of whatever their upbringing was. You know, I, I say that all animals are reflections of how they were raised. Um, in the pure world where we don't have poachers, where we don't have people, you know, abusing animals, uh, generally speaking, you don't find those kinds of bad animals. But like in a chimp society, which is like a human society, there are thugs, okay? There are gang members. What? That, oh yeah, there's no question about it. Animal gangs? 
animal gangs. Absolutely. Wow. What do they call? They create these these cliques, these gangs that can be, you know, very disruptive to the rest of the troop, can be uh, flat out dangerous to the rest of the troop. And those gangs will perpetuate that behavior to future generations. So you see that. Uh, you know, I don't want to come across like, oh, all animals are these pure Disney wonderful animals and they don't mean any harm at all. It's not that. I'm saying under ideal circumstances, when animals are raised under uh, uh, normal, beautiful, natural circumstances, yes, they may have struggles and yes, they could be dangerous because they don't understand what you represent, but there isn't that malice that you'll see that can be learned from growing up in a culture that is passed down from whatever, you know, wherever they were raised. So yes, bad animals, could be um, attracted to bad people, uh, to bad behaviors. Scar from Lion King, bad egg. Yes. And yeah, the well, hyenas. And then, well, no, the hyena, no, the hyenas got a bad rap in Lion King. I gotta uh, tell you, the hyenas are whoa, really cool whoa, animals. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, hyenas are cool animals. Not in the Lion King, Disney, Ron. Disney screwed up. Okay, what do you because mean? They screwed up in that film because Be they careful. gave hyenas I've got, a really I've bad got like label. Non, non-disparagement agreement. Be careful here, please. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm serious. They, they, they the evil not... laugh, Ron. Careful, oh. Ron. Yeah, that laugh. No, guys, I, guys. I don't care. They can sue me. Scar is a real asshole. <laughs> yeah, Ron. <laughs> I've said it. Come at me. Ron, put it, Scar, put it on the poll. Scar, What's Scar an asshole? Scar and like? Foss are like one of those like nature versus nurture things, right? Because they came from the same parents and they turned out so differently. Why is that? Because what Disney did was they um, they basically well, what's the the, 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 the play yeah. Macbeth no not Macbeth what is the play it's the Shakespeare play they they basically did with animals okay where well, the brothers were against each other what is that play you guys know it you're more culturally whatever <laughs> is it Macbeth you're I asking I, me Ron I don't know <laughs> I don't know what I'm not oh. familiar it's Hamlet you're, you're, oh. There it is. Hamlet. oh Hamlet oh. of course. Yeah. That's it. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> no, you're Shakespeare. <laughs> Thank there you. you. Go. There you go. So, you know, listen, they, 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 they anthropomorphized those animals and they made the bad guys versus the good guys. Um, but at the end of the day, they really did a disservice to an animal that deserves respect, credibility. The hyenas are incredible animals that play a very important role and they don't necessarily go after little lion cubs, even though they will take one out if they get the opportunity. The worst animal you've had at the zoo when you say you've had bad animals, is there one above all others in the history of the zoo where you're like, this one, gee, gee, just incorrigible, like will not behave? Um, it's not a matter of behaving. It's just there was a level of aggression in the animal. It was a tiger uh, that was here um, that was, you know, we knew, we knew that if that tiger were ever to get access to somebody, he would, he would kill them instantly. He was an incredibly aggressive tiger, a male, big male, very territorial, very defensive of the, of the area that he lived in. And, uh, you know, you, you didn't even hesitate to think for one moment that, uh, you know, he wouldn't be so bad. No, 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 no. That, that I remember that tiger very well. As a matter of fact, I would get shivers up my spine when I walked by the front of the exhibit and the way he looked at me across the moat. Um, that was something that would, uh, yeah, it would put the fear of God in me. Not to bring it back to the Lion King, but just to close the loop. So hyenas <laughs> got a bad rap because they don't attack lions, but they would attack lions if they could attack lions. Hyenas will fight lions to try to get food, um, but they don't. They're not just scavengers. In other words, uh, you know. There are times when a hyena makes a kill and it's eating and lions come and beat the crap out of the hyena and the hyena runs away because he doesn't have enough backup. And there are times when one lioness may make a kill and there's a whole clan of hyenas and they'll go in there and say, you know what, tit for tat, and they'll go in there and, and chase that lioness off the food to get the food. But it's not they want to kill the lioness. They want to remove the lioness as a form of competition. It's all about competition, survival of the fittest. What I'm saying is they're both adept predators. Uh, they both deserve respect in their own way. Um, but yeah, yeah, to your point, a hyena will kill a lion if it has the opportunity. But lions will also kill a hyena if they have an opportunity. So what makes one worse than the other? Guillermo also put on the poll, do you know why it's tit for tat? Do you know oh, what those things are and what that means? I've got two more questions before we get you out of here. You mentioned anthropomorphic and the idea that what? the chimp perhaps would be uh, you know, food interested or any of these relationships would be food interested. But you also made the point there are plenty of that that same chimp. Other people have food and that chimp's not nice to those people who have food. Correct. Like it's not it's not just food. In your case, you've seen something else, a different behavior. That's a good point. No, you're, you're right, Dan. There are people that that chimp hates whether they have food or not. 
Um, and, and whether I have food or not, uh, she seems to love me. Um, she doesn't get necessarily disappointed when she sees me and I don't have food. Um, whereas, you know, she'll throw crap at other people. Um, she, she, she really, it's a special animal. Special Actually animal. throws feces at other people. Um, well, I don't know about feces, but rocks and whatever she can get a hold of. And let's close this out. And again, a reminder, this man cares deeply about the animals. You know this already after all these years, but also across the decades. But also he is someone who... No bureaucracy. The money that you donate gets to care for the animals without any interference. So support his endowment where and if you can. Close us out with the sound that you make for the giraffes to come running over. I just kind of call her name. I kind of go, Lizard! Lizard! Come on, Blizzard, Mia! Come on, Mia! Come on, Naka! I do it just like that. So it's a way that nobody else can really look like an idiot doing it. So they immediately associate that. I'm, I'm glad that was entertaining for you. Guys. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. He speaks to the animals. He's a modern day Tarzan. Also, Mike Ryan left the studio while you were talking because he's uh, Metal Ark is now in negotiations for the movie rights of a pet that you uh, take a zipper and a child is inside. A little dog. Uh, Aaron talks with Marlon Wayans right now, actually. Is that the running yeah, title? That, I don't know what the title is going to be yet but we're in negotiations thank you ron thanks guys have a good week see you ron all right we have not talked enough this week about the conference championship games and i have a theory you guys ready for it yes i love a good chris theory every once in a while query um i'm trying how i can say this without making it too sexual but oh, the nfl i don't know if i do can you make it sexual as possible Thursday, the nfl had an orgasm last week and we're done we, 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 we can't do better than the football we did last weekend. So we're just tired. We're this not is the... such a bad analogy. No, so you're only not. limited please, to one. Please right? extrapolate. Explain your analogy Bills to and Chiefs was sex, and I'm not ready to go yet again. You don't, you don't have extra round it's two. It's just like it was so good. Well, hold on. Let's go back. I, I want to take this away from sex, but you ever have like but you started you can't with sex. Call the refraction. No, period. don't take it away from no, sex. You can't. Hold we on. Can't. Hold on. Here. Let's do this. I think you guys get the point. I'm trying. You're no, just saying. You're just literally saying anticlimax. You're talking about almost literally anticlimax. That it can't be as good as it was. That was climax, and that's as good as it's going to get. But I, I thought that from game to game last week. I thought that last weekend. It seems impossible. Right? I was disappointed that we're doing our watch party on Sunday on Rams and 49ers because it's less interesting to me than Chiefs and Bengals. And it's not through any fault of their own. I know that the Rams are a really cool system team and Stafford's better than Goff and they're fun to watch offensively. And McVay is a great coach. And I don't know enough about football to know what Shanahan can do against McVay. And I also don't know when you've got Kittle hurt and you've got Trent Williams hurt, and you got these guys crawling off of the field at the end of the game. Crawling off of the field. Samuel, too. I don't know how healthy they are, and so I can't project what's going to happen in that game, but the narrative on this game is Shanahan knows how to do this against McVay. That's that's what's people are don't they, who don't trust the Rams are saying because Shanahan's going to figure out some way to neutralize this, correct? To do the thing to him that Belichick did to him in in the Super Bowl. But I don't know football well enough to know that deconstruction. I don't understand football so that so that you can tell me what the hell that Shanahan can do that McVay can't do. And the funny thing is they're doing it all with Jimmy Garoppolo, who was kind of tossed in a heap of, hey, we don't really care about him. He's not that good. We drafted a quarterback, what, th third overall? He's the worst quarterback who was in these playoffs. I think I can say that. I think they've Easily. been hot. Tannehill, they, him or Tannehill. They've been hiding well, him. Still left. They they win hiding him when they're healthy. They get six minutes from winning the Super Bowl. Garoppolo is four and one in his five playoff games and has been a shitty quarterback in almost all of them and has won four of them. And it goes to show you how good San Francisco is and how good the coaching staff is in San Francisco that, albeit with their fourth or fifth string running back, they're still able to get chunk plays and chunk yardage. Shows you how good their offensive line is, how good their system but is. They, but it's all scheme stuff, right? It's stuff that's uh, above our pay grade analyzing sports i mean people are doing it pro football folks everybody's trying to keep up with these geniuses but when when shanahan's 49ers are healthy now he's, he's like a, a career 500 record in san francisco it's unimpressive 
But when they're healthy, they can do things like, oh, look, they went to Lambeau and Dallas, and you're not that surprised because when they're healthy and they haven't even needed Kittle to do it. Kittle hasn't had one of these 150-yard playoff games. They've done it all with Samuel and hiding Garoppolo, and they beat Aaron Rodgers, and they beat Dak Prescott. I feel like we're selling this NFC Championship game by saying these two coaches are going to have a nerd off. But that's what we're going to be watching oh, Sunday, yeah. something that we don't understand. Like, fundamentally, on Sunday, we're going to have a watch party. Like boring sex. With that's our they're audience. Gonna oh, they're going to watch, it. yes, they're gonna watch us do and... missionary style on YouTube yes. on Sunday. <laughs> yes. I think Burrow... <laughs> Now that I'm thinking about this more, Burrow and and Mahomes can make like Burrow can maybe do what Josh Allen did. Just that offense is. We good. saw it already though. Like, that's what I mean. That could be a fun game. So I'm really excited. Like, all right, I'm back. We get some, we get I, some I, nice I, missionary. So sex. you're back. He, round two. He's we're ready. Some... Analogy is so bad. Please stop <laughs> doing it too. Analogy. Please stop Just, doing it. He said he's ready. It's awful. We all agreed that last weekend's football was sex. No, yeah. we don't all agree you on that analogy. Up, you brought up the topic. It was yes, it's the it's the best that sports can ever that, that sports can do. do. That's it. We're done. We shouldn't play anymore. That, Let's that, just cancel the rest of it. He is saying that we we. I mean, what he's saying is we've shot our load. That's what he's saying. He tried to Jeez, say that without it saying it, Dan. Why That's exactly what he was like trying that? to say. I'm like Whittingham. I want to be able to talk like this. Remember I mean, earlier you didn't that we say no, that's it. Not the same wanted thing. to say penis. No, why can't I talk about a load? That's that's. It's a totally different thing, Chris. Chris. Why can't he talk about a load, Chris, Dan? you really Jesus. want one of the announcers to, to begin the broadcast this Sunday at that would 3 p.m. Look, hey, listen, everybody. We know we shot our load last week, but we're going <laughs> to try. Yeah. If Jim Nance said that, we're, we're that gonna, would be amazing. We're, look, we really, that's what you want. You want honest broadcasting. I kind of want Romo to say it, though. Who would say? Uh, who, he would just make the sound effects. Who's? <laughs> what does that sound like? No, uh, don't. Jim. Oh, wait, please what stop he says doing every that. Week when he watches football. Can we get Stink to do it when he said, I love football? It, it felt like he was ejaculating. Let's see. We've opened the doors. I'm uncomfortable. It's too much. It's too I'm uncomfortable. Even for Thursday, Chris, it's I'm too much. I'm uncomfortable. I said orgasm at the beginning. I These tried are to keep it. Chris, you too really much. don't understand the difference between these things. Whittingham trying to bring science to the broadcast by, by normalizing scrotum and penis because they're simply an anatomical terms. And you saying, no, I want somebody to be a swinging dick out here. I want Jim Nance to come out here and say, you know what, Cowboys? We blew our load last week. But wait till you see what football gives you this week. A a full-on erection. Football's going to try and ram you, but football's tired. Football's got nothing I left. I just love the idea of CBS's broadcast, like the imaging coming up, and you just hear Nance's voice. Last week was sex, folks, but we'll try this week. That's not. That'll just be. be good... Why are we trying? No. Because they're trying to. We can't recreate. All right, let's but take what away. If let's we get do. away from sex. He's got to make the game important, not All impotent. Right, I got it. Yeah. We're not doing sex anymore. Last week's football was the best party you've ever been to in your life. And now we're trying to have another party this weekend. And I'm just like not as excited about it because of the good party I was at what last Burrow, week. What if Burrow and Mahomes analogy. do a better? Thank you. Huh? Burrow and Mahomes do right, a better game this week. That's tickling me a little bit. And then we got a nerd off. I'm down. I'm back. I like it a little simple every once in a while. Back to a party. The party simple. I, he I wants to bring it back to sex, sex. so bad. Tickling. He wants to do it You're so just bad. Like tickling in there. You threw tickling in there. Now I'm picturing McVeigh and Shanahan having boring sex, and it's a funny visual. Oh. Jesus Christ, Chris. Not like, Why'd he take it We're going to have to bleep this entire no, hour. Not. Chris, if he can say penis. Chris, I don't think you understand. if <laughs> this, Your oafishness here is exceeding all, all levels. That you don't understand the difference. You simply, I, I'm explaining this to you the way that I would to a six-year-old. Between the argument Whittingham was making that he wants to do on his broadcast, which is simply to say, if somebody gets hit in the penis, to be able to say they get hit in the penis, or the balls, or to say the testicles, to say the word as opposed to down there or underneath, that you don't understand the difference between that and the last five minutes of horror you have spewed upon America. Truly horror. Like horror that, you, that, if, that is, is flabbergasting to me. The ovary that sits before me, that you don't understand the difference between what Whittingham was saying Bunch of prudes. and what you're presently saying. So you and your dad are going to do the body broadcast on Sunday night. <laughs> wow, do you want to do that? that? Yeah, you know what, Chris? If you want to do that on Sunday, if you and your dad want to dirty it up, how dirty can the Cody's make it because they don't understand the way that this stuff is supposed to work? He should have to do the entire Sunday watch along as naked Chris. Yes. I didn't come up 
with the analogy analogy of last weekend's football being like... You read that somewhere and thought you could repeat it? No, I read... Everyone was just trying to come up with how to express how amazing that was. And we've all made the joke, but that was like sex. Now I need a cigarette. I'm not saying something... Who made that here. joke? You make the I need right, a cigarette. Don you Draper. Can. You've yeah, Dan, made I the I need a cigarette too, yeah. joke. I think I made a joke. We too, all may yeah, have I made don't. that joke. I don't know why I'm being. I don't do cigarette. I do sandwich. I, well, I, that's I, what my point is. Is like you guys are coming at me like I'm this deviant. Just because, no, like, I'm it's the like, way just, you're talking about it that you don't understand. I said load. No, because yes, yes. Well, that's part of God. it. That is part of it. Yes. <laughs> that is part of it. That's only a small part of it, though, because. You not understanding that load is not an anatomical term or a scientific term is one of the most stupefying things I've ever seen in my life. That you think that the, sh- the, the I, mean, I don't even want to say it again because I just did it comedically for the joke that you don't understand the difference between an honest broadcast and that is funny to me because we find c- ejaculate. Ron McGill did use ejaculate. <laughs> he said a pint of ejaculate. Scientifically. Yeah. Scien- Science schmience. Yeah. Winning wants to say penis. I understand, but that's not what we're arguing oh, about. I love how he, because he comes in here no. with his hair gel no. looking like a no. parliament no. on vacation, <laughs> he can say penis. Chris. But if the guy with the unshaven beard says <laughs> load, he's Chris. a deviant over here. Chris. This, I get the difference. You Dan. don't understand. I get it. He wants to instead of saying midsection, he wants to say penis. Chris, I get it. You, this is the, the part that you're not understanding that is making this high comedy. Is that if Whittingham were to do that on the air, it would be allowed on any broadcast in America, but Twitter would go crazy because of our repressions and be like, "You can't do that. You can't say that." And then the FCC would call, and he might actually get into some trouble. If he did what you're suggesting, I think load is safe. If yeah. he not did, one of the eight words. If he did what you're suggesting, he would immediately be fired, and it wouldn't just be Twitter outrage. He would trend on Twitter. He, he would, Twitter. Be, he would, he would Twitter, be a though. source of eternal shame, being fired. Can you believe that that broadcaster just lost his job on Sunday Night Football in America by saying that a quarterback had blown his load or ejaculated? Load sounds better than ejaculated in that sentence. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I mean, can we just stick better. with the party analogy? I thought it was much better. So much better. Sex is a party. That's true. Sunday <laughs> night on YouTube, Levitard and Friends, Naked Chris, sex is a party. Hello? Yo, Pops. Yeah. Yeah. You all right? What? Yeah, I'm fine. You have the hearing aid in, or what are you doing? No, I can hear you, John. Do you have your hearing aid in? What are you doing? I can hear you. All right, you're on the radio, just so you know. Bro. We're not on the radio. Oh, we're... I am. Thanks. Yeah, we're recording Thanks you. Telling just... everyone I, I wear a hearing aid. Well, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, it's not a big deal, Dad. I mean, you should wear it more often. I love yeah. you, but anyway, um, because I like having conversations with you. Somehow, we stumbled into a conversation where I was telling Dan. And Dan has some follow-up questions for you. And Dan really wanted to talk to you, although he's still waiting. I know you're still waiting for Dan to call you to do that South Beach session he promised that he would do. But uh, we stumbled into a conversation of you swimming in the nude. And I always found it fascinating that you did that when I was younger in the backyard. And uh, I think Dan had some follow-up questions to that. Man, this is super awkward. Bob, hello. Uh, good to talk to you. First time uh, you're I, meeting. I, 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 it's super awkward. Nice to talk to you, Bob. We're not on the radio. We're on a podcast. That's what happens, though, when your son is in charge with the heavy lifts around here. We asked him to have a conversation with you, and he threw it over to me to have with you. So, hello. It's nice to well, see you. and Nice to talk to you, I should say. Likewise. Likewise. I figured after 22 years, perhaps you two should talk to each other. You know, uh, I spent you. plenty of time talking to your figured? family. That's yeah. what you yeah. figured. Anyway, yeah, uh, so <laughs> thank you, Bob. And it's yes, we are on the air right now. Our so- I'm sorry that we didn't tell you that uh, more professionally, but we were talking about you swimming in the nude, and I was marveling. I was saying, what great freedom to have at 80 years old to be someone who could live that free. I was envious of you. Uh, well, I found out, uh, you know, we had a pool in our backyard and I used to uh, get up early in the morning and, uh, swim in the nude. And the, uh, reason I, I had never done it before until I visited a neighbor who had an indoor pool and they all swam in the nude. So I tried it and liked it. 
seems wonderful. It really does. I've got. I, it seems like a wonderful thing. And so you do it every day. And I did not mean for any of this to be creepy. <laughs> I it, did. It just makes me happy that you do it every day. And thank you for stopping by and telling us about it. Would you mind ranking uh, your top three Bob Wiener uh, swimming strokes for us uh, from in the from, nude from bottom oh, from yes. bottom to top? Though, wait, Dad, how many times were you upset when you would come downstairs, go to the swimming pool, and I was still out by the pool partying? Uh, there were a number of occasions <laughs> that I used to get up in, in the middle of the night, uh, to have to go to the bathroom and I'd look out the backyard, the back window, and there'd be a party going on. Yeah. And, uh, and it was John's party and I was only wishing they would get out of there early enough so I could go swim. Yeah. I was getting the pool ready for you. Swim nude. nude swim nude. Uh, Bob, good talking to you. I hope that one day we can swim nude together. <laughs> what? There, I said it. What? I just hope we can do it one day. <laughs> What's your preferred stroke? Top three strokes with Bob Wiener. Are you ready, Bob? Uh, not really, but Dan, uh, you know what? If I ever do get into the pool... I'll I'll match your stroke for stroke. Hell yeah! Right, now he's wow, baby. <laughs> Whoa! Yes. Wait, Dad. Yes. He wants that, Dad, Dad, Dad. He wants your top three swimming no, strokes. No, no, I we can't want. wait to match him. Back stroke, stroke, breast stroke, butterfly stroke, full frontal stroke. In yeah. Can I come too? The yeah. pool. Hell yeah! Pool party. This is so uncomfortable. <laughs> You know what? Uh, I'm I'm taken aback by this, but I may be able to give you some strokes. Yes. Breast stroke. Yes. Uh, side stroke. <laughs> yes. Oh, nice. Yes. Nice. Hold yes. on. Wow. Give us right. Wow. Give us Hold all on. right. Yes. Hold Wait a minute. Slow down. Slow Breast stroke is what? number three. Okay. Uh, let's do it. Slow it down. All right. Number two was what? Slow Dad? the stroke down. No, number no, two no, was let, what? No. Yeah. Which one stroke? I hope last one stroke down. Well, number three. <laughs> Breast stroke is three. All right. Side stroke. Dad, is wait. Two. Dad, wait. Dad, wait. Dad, wait. Dad. And number one, your number one swimming stroke is? Uh, crawl. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I don't know that last one, but. Side stroke, though. <laughs> I'm assuming you guys know what a, I'm assuming you guys know what a crawl is. No idea, sir. <laughs> Can you explain it, Mr. Wiener? No, I, uh, the crawl is how you normally swim. Hand over hand when you're swimming going forward. Australian crawl. Freestyle. To, uh, all, uh, youngsters. <laughs> youngsters. What's that? I think the, Oli the Olympics calls it freestyle, that, that stroke. Okay, we'll go freestyle, but in my day, it was you, it was known as the Australian crawl. That a boy. All right. Yeah, bleep off, Chris Cody. Thank yep. you, Bob. Stay strong, Dad. Good talking to you, sir. Great speaking with you, sir. Likewise. Thank you. All right, we'll go swimming later.